let's um, yeah, get going. So um, this evening is really uh, a very abbreviated version of the um, pilot owner maintenance course we run in BJ anyway. I think I've only run one this year, um, but we are planning to run an awful lot more over the winter as required and so on. Um, and this really comes in with a change of law, uh, as we talk about later, because um, the BGA is going from what's called a camo to becoming a cow. And what that means is there's actually quite a lot of deregulation going on. So, so right. Um, so the idea this evening is to introduce and skims the surface of what you can and can't do. But we're not just going to talk about how to make riders pretty and stuff like that. Actually, look at the real guts of it. It's actually uh, you know, how to find damage to wings, fins, pylons, that sort of stuff. The stuff that really matters, the stuff that might actually hurt you if you get it wrong. So, um, first of all, a bit about me, those of you who don't know me. Um, my name is Gordon MacDonald. I work for the BGA full-time, five days a week. Um, I'm a very lucky person. I left school at 16. I've been a gliding bum my entire life. Um, I started a engineering apprenticeship with a company at Ashton called Southdown Aero Services. And they, at the time, all they did was mend broken gliders, um, maintain a few light aircraft, and we manufactured a uh, composite microlight called the Pipistrel. And, so and part of that uh, apprenticeship I did with them was spending quite a lot of time in Germany making LS4s and 6s in the 1980s. So if any of you got an LS4 or 6 built back 1986, 87, 88, that sort of area, there's a good chance there's some nice stippling inside it. So, um, I then became a sort of permanent gliding instru instructor and uh, repairer. Um, got my commercial pilots on the way, went for regionals. Um, I rebuilt many insurance write-offs. It's a good second income for me. And actually was a deposit of my first house, um, selling gliders that I'd rebuilt. Uh, spent, spent a chunk of the 1990s working at Southern Sailplanes, which was really good. In those days, we were allowed to do big repairs, like repairing main spars and carbon spars and having sort of venter swings snapped in half and then joining them back together, that sort of thing, which nowadays you're not allowed to do those repairs generally. Not because they're not technically possible, but it's, it's not, often not economically possible. Um, I ended up being CFR at Lasham for a few years, um, became Lasham's chief engineer, then eventually started working for the BGA. Um, my biggest claim to fame in gliding is I flew from a Boeing down to Lasham once in a number three with a family in Darlington, which is still, I think, a UK straight line distance record. Um, that was taken off at 3.50 in the morning. Um, and my personal glider, I've got an Ash 25 and a Slingsby Eagle. Um, uh, the Eagle was bought as a bit of derelict glider. I've got a Beach Bonanza that was actually bought off a bank after it's derelict for three years, a Super Monk, and I've got three written off standard services that are going to be for me and the kids one day when I get around to rebuilding them. My kids are only like 7 and 11 at the moment. So. Right. Um, a quest from insurers. Please don't let this happen to you. But every two years or so, we destroy a glider um, through quite simply towing it with a sticking wheel brake, or worse, towing it with the air brakes out. Um, and it does happen uh, all too often. I think the ATC have lost a few gliders as well this way. Uh, we've lost things like Joe Discuses, I think we lost an Ash 26. We've had some very, very expensive insurance claims for the simple reason. So if you ever notice your wheel brakes actually sticking um, and you can't get it to unstick, it's a simple case of um, typically get a, a 716 to 11 meter spanner and you unscrew the brake pads, take the pad power off, and that then means it's um, safe to turn across the airfield and get it fixed at some other point. Right, minimum equipment for owning a glider. Okay, All gliders, doesn't matter if it's a... Skylark, Primary, or uh, you know, Nimbus 4, or Arcus, whatever, is everyone needs this. Um, a 5.5 millimeter camera with a built-in light source and a really posh one cost about 20 quid. And that's Wi-Fi to Apple, Android, and stuff like that. Why 5.5 millimeter camera? First of all, the average drain hole is six millimeters which means you can poke it into all the nooks and crannies where there's a drain hole in the glider usually, and uh, you can see what's going on. Um, more about cameras later and actually what they do for us. But yes, if you haven't got one, get one. Right. 
Um, pilot owner maintenance. Now, um, in a moment, uh, Luke's going to put the document up there, but there's a list in the answer of exactly what we can and cannot do. Um, this list has actually been around for quite some time. Um, you know, it's quite an old list, actually. It hasn't changed much in seven or eight years. Uh, and when we go through it, uh, you'll understand that essentially it's more, it looks more or less like an it's all annual maintenance, effectively. Um, now, there's three lists in the other system. Um, one for small helicopters, one for um, standard light aircraft, things like bobbins and tugs and st stuff like that and so on. And there's this one. And this is for sailplanes, uh, which is indicated by the SP bit, self-sustaining or powered sailplanes and self-launching powered sailplanes and towing motor gliders. Some of the terminology used in engineering is not the same terminology used in flight crew licensing. So occasionally you'll have to get your head around that. So, so as a pilot owner, what can you do? Okay. Um, first of all, you're allowed to recalculate the weight of your glider. It does not say weigh. In fact, in, in some other, uh, other AMC documents, it actually says you can't weigh gliders. Um, so basically, if you fit an instrument panel to your glider, as you can do as a pilot owner, you're allowed to weigh the old one, weigh the new one, figure out the differences, and actually uh, calculate a difference. It is actually better if you can re-weigh the glider, if you can do that sort of work. So, but you can do that to sailplanes, to self-sustaining sailplanes, and TMGs. Um, towing. So you've got, say, a folk that's used for towing, aero towing that is. Um, you can play with the winch retraction mechanisms and stuff like that, lubricate it, and you can fit mirrors. Um, placards. You're allowed to change your own placards. So if your placards are all getting a bit um, crumpled, rubbish, and everything else, uh, you're allowed to make your own new ones so long as uh, they comply with the maintenance manual. Uh, or flight manual, well, both, in fact. Uh, the other thing is a ASI is a placard. Um, most gliders built since the late 60s, it's a requirement to actually have the ASI placarded as well, with v &E, rough air, stuff like that, and so on. Um, and so you must make sure the ASI placards agree with the flight manual. And there's another document called a type specific data sheet as well. Okay. Um, standard practices, uh, safety wiring, non-structural fasteners, um, you're allowed to check the free play. Why is that? Well, those of you who've ever done much gliding in Germany will understand that in Germany, majority of the annual maintenance gliders is done on pilot owner maintenance, not by inspectors. And this list essentially was drawn up by the LBA, more or less. And um, it reflects um, how a lot of the, the German system goes about doing the annual maintenance. So a bit about free play okay um when checking the free play of the glider um if you go to the flight or maintenance manual there'll be limits as to how much the control surface should move and also um how much play you're allowed a lot of older gliders even ones built in the 70s it doesn't specify how much free play you're allowed now if you take that to extreme have a free point use of free play this aircraft can have really fluttering control surfaces um, so in the BJ system, we say, if you've got um, a amount of free play and it's not specified in the manuals to how much free play you're allowed in the control surface, and when I say free play, I'm talking about go to the treading edge and how much float there is, not, not float, as it were, wow. up and down there is in the treading edge of the control surface or trimmer or rudder or anything like that and so on. Um, and the limit is three millimetres. So if the manual doesn't specify a maximum play amount, you're not allowed more than three millimetres. But that three millimeters of play can't be in just one place. If you have three millimeters of play and it's all in one bolt, that's a very, very worn out bolt, probably half cut in half of that. So yeah, it should be a collection of um, free play rather than just free play in one particular area. Um, air conditioning, so if you've got a ventilation system in your glider and so on, you can change the hoses and ducts on that. Communication, um, they never called it radios. Uh, communication, you can fit your own communication devices as so long as they're plug and play. And, um, if you ever talk to NAB boys and so on, they can flog you plugs for um, plug and play radios quite often, I think. Um, and batteries, you can change your own batteries, you can change simple wiring for varios and stuff like that. Um, 
technically you're not allowed to do the soldering for radios, if you can get anything about it. Um, and you can you know, repair broken wires for uh, lights and stuff like that in motor riders. Right, okay. Um, I'm just going to go to the next page now and back to the top. So most riders have some basic um, bonding for lightning strike and stuff. If that breaks, you're allowed to fix it yourself. Switches. You can repair and install switches that are non-required, i.e. not a magneto switch, but definitely a Vario switch or something like that and so on. The rule is all switches must be labelled. So in theory, anybody can get the cockpit and know what that switch does. Fuses. You can change fuses. Safety belts. You can uh, change your safety belts, but they must be AASA safety belts. So, so you can do that. Uh, you can take the seat out and put it back in. Uh, non-essential instruments. Now, what's a non-essential instrument? A non-essential instrument is an instrument that's not on your aircraft minimum equipment list. So if you look at the aircraft flight manual, in that flight manual is specify usually minimum instruments. Now, for a pure cell plane, that would normally be an ASI altimeter um, and for cloud flying, a compass and turn slip. So if you're not going to go cloud flying, you can ditch the turn slip and compass. A Vario is not generally deemed to be a minimum instrument. For aerobatics, you usually need a accelerometer. Um, for a anything with an engine, um, minimum equipment will include a compass, so on, which is absolutely required by law if it has an engine. Um, and the other bit of minimum equipment is if you have a water bath system and it actually works, intend to use it, you must have an outside air temperature gauge of some sort. So, okay. Um, right, wing wipers, uh, you can fit and play with those. Um, you can use different types of static probe, just for the Vario system, not for the ASI system. Um, you can uh, install portable auction bottles in factory built holders, that sort of thing. Um, if you've got an old Nimbus 2 or open Cirrus, you can actually repack it and break parachutes. Um, a good piece of equipment, um, not widely used in the gliding industry, but uh, a very popular powered in industry, is the emergency location transmitter, um, you know, which goes off and after sort of heavy map of G and so on. Um, don't do what my one friend of mine had. He had it on the back of a wardrobe, and um, it did fall off. It set it off, and about two days later, he got a knock at the door from somebody telling him to turn it off. Um, Fire protection warning systems, um, that's getting more popular on electric sailplanes. I don't think I've seen them appear in jet sailplanes yet, which is a bit surprising. Um, flight controls, you're allowed to fit your own gap seals as so long as you don't take the control off. So if your mardars all get a bit tired and knackered as it does after six, seven seasons, that sort of way, it goes a bit brittle and starts not working and becoming inflexible, um, you're actually allowed to change it yourself. The but is, um, you can't take a control off. Now, you wouldn't normally to do that anyway, but when you've got the Milo off, it's the only time in probably six or seven years you're actually going to have to properly clean, degrease, and lubricate your hinges. So it's really important. You don't just take the Milo off um, and just put new Milo on. No, you need to get into the hinges and give them a proper service, um, clean them out, degrease them, get all the rubbish out of them, um, re lubricate them. So on, check them for play and check the hinges themselves. I mean, if you've got things like Airtube 20, those hinges used to be for pastime. Um, so check them for play as well. You're allowed to play with control systems um, in terms of uh, measuring them. Uh, control cables, uh, simple inspections. And what you're looking for here is um, frayed cables. Now, the cables that fray the most, uh, obviously rudder cables are around about the S-bends, but that's not usually what breaks first. The cables that break first are normally release cables, um, especially on club two-seaters. Uh, and also, um, and that's around the knobs themselves, where it tends to fatigue where the knob attaches to it. And if you ever have rudder pedal adjustments, again, around the T-handles, and the ones that break off the most in flight, because nobody ever actually checks them, and they're always too weak anyway, are decompressor handles on turbos. For some reason, they give them really tiny cables that um, fray for pastime. Um, and the most awkward cable to change the world uh, when it goes wrong is probably a discus rudder cable adjustment. Um, you don't want that to um, break, because when it does, it's an utter, utter 
um, fast trying to actually get it changed. You often have to take out the whole instrument panel, uh, even actually take out the pedals in some situations. Um, yeah, some people got the knack and some people haven't. But what could seem like like a twenty minute job could easily be a five six hour job changing that cable. Um, you are allowed to change uh, the gas dampers in your air brake systems. Um, a number of gliders, mosquitoes, number threes, stuff like that, have a gas strut in the air brake system. Um, quite a few modern gliders have gone down a slightly different avenue. Joe Discus XL run having one gas strut in the middle. So that way, if the gas strut fails, both flaps come up together. Um, so on. It has independent gas struts. So what tends to happen is the on the Joe Discus XL, as you pull out the air brakes, the last third of the air brake deploys the flap which goes down to, I think, 60 or 70 degrees, um, maybe even more, actually. Um, but the push rod isn't directly connected to the flap. It's actually connected via a gas strut. The idea being, if you fly too fast, you're not actually going to break the flaps off. Um, I wouldn't actually test it, though. Um, the bad news is, if the gas strut fails on a Joe XL, it will fail asymmetrically. In other words, one will stay down and the other one will go up. And you know you won't know that until you're usually um, opening them you know quite often for the last um, third of the travel. So if you're in the habit of getting down to the round out and about two thirds air brake, and then going full brake, um, and one of the gas struts has failed, the whole aircraft will want to roll as you're deploying the air brakes. Um, so on. Um, and for whatever reason, some of these gas struts aren't that good of quality. They, they tend to you know uh, break for a pastime. So. Um, if you're doing annual maintenance on Geodiscus XLs, and um, I think the ARC is the same, but I'm not certain, um, you'll be very, very uh, keen to look at the gas struts and make sure they're good condition and replace them probably every year or two, I suggest. All right, you can change fuel lines if they're prefabricated and plug and play, which is often mine nowadays. Um, you can change the fuel filter. You can take the whole instrument panel off as long as it has quick release connectors and all the major bits, i.e. ASI, radios, stuff like that. Right. Okay. okay, Peter Static, simple sense leak check, in other words, making sure uh -huh. the um, ASIs don't leak. Um, for SW series, those gliders often have little rubber vibration mounts on them for the instrument panels, so you can change those. If you've got a Polish glider, they've got beautiful water drains in them, and so on, quite a few of them have, so you can play with the water drain systems, and any damaged or flexible tubes you can change. Right, you can take the whole wheel out, um, service it, replace the wheel bearings, and lubricate it all. Um, you can change the hydraulic fluid. Now, a word of warning on glider hydraulic fluid. Some gliders use proper aircraft hydraulic fluid, um, maybe like K21 does. Um, the butt with gliders, the majority of gliders use aircraft quality brake calipers, the bits on the brake disc that actually clamp and stop you uh, moving but they use motorbike master cylinders. In other words, um, the keep the size down the in the cockpit, um, they tend to use motorbike parts. Now the problem is the car industry doesn't use the same fluid the aircraft industry does. And so when they're making a glider, they have to decide, are we gonna change all the seals in the master cylinder for the motorbike or we can change all the seals in the caliper um, and so on. And it's like this case, they changed all the seals in the it's about handling the cockpit. And so on that one, you can use proper aircraft type fluids. Whereas Grob, for instance, went the other way. They went and changed all the seals in the caliper. And so, on. Um, so if you put aircraft fluid in the um, Grob, so on, in this the Grob on a freeze, for instance, the chances are in two weeks' time, the cylinders in the caliper will swell up and stop working. Um, so on. And that can be a bit frustrating because Often you buy these calipers from America. There's a company called Cleveland to make them, and that's the cheapest place to buy them. Um, but if you don't know it's actually got the wrong seals in it, uh, that's a big issue. So um, the manuals of the gliders are very bad at giving you this information. So, um, right, let's talk about what's next. Okay, wheels, servicing hydraulic fluid, shock absorbers. Um, if you've got a Pukat or Boshan, you can change your own bungees. And that is a very dangerous job, and I'd much rather somebody else does it. Um, there aren't many gliders nowadays with shock struts in them. Um, I think maybe PW5 has it, and I think all the Blanix had them, they were all dead. Maybe the RS29s had it. 
So on, but you're allowed to recharge them for the air, or actually more from not, you charge them full of um, nitrogen if you if that type. Uh, you can take the undercarriage doors off. Um, skis are a bit relevant to us. Skids, you can take those off. Um, wheel fairings, take them off and put them back on, obviously. Drum brakes, you can play with those. You can change the brake pads and change the springs on the brake pads and so on. Um, top tip there on the brake pads, if you're ever going to go in there, they're always shiny and horrible. Um, they're typically made of asbestos type materials. So somewhere very much downwind of you, you probably want to rough them up with some 80 grit before you put them back in. Never put them back in shiny. So they don't work. Okay. Um, and the gear warning system, you can actually fit your own uh, gear warning system if you so choose. If you've got lights on the motor glider, you can change all those. Um, navigation software, flam software, that sort of stuff you can do all yourself. So on. Um, you can fit an entire fabric patch all by yourself as long as no rib stitching is required. Um, that actually is quite a big thing. Uh, if you look at the tops of, a, say, a K14 wing or folk wing, especially at the root end of the wing, you know, those fabric patches are pretty, pretty big. Um, and if you don't bond it on properly, going for a winter launch, it will tear off. So, yeah, don't do that without an awful lot of um, advice and help first, I suggest, if you haven't done it before. Um, uh, and I wouldn't just trust YouTube to give you that advice in the case of a fabric patch. There's a bit more to it than that. So, right, and our last page, um, it goes on about surface finish minor restoration. Um, you can do minor repairs to fairings and stuff. Uh, if you've got a motor out of a door on it, something like a Goblin or 9, you can uh, take it off and put it back on again. Um, you can play with your upholstery, mount repairs to the upholstery and stuff like that. Um, be aware there are some fire retardation requirements. So, um, windows, so CV panels, windows, you can take those off and place them, play with them, so on. Canopies, you can take it off, put it back on. The canopy gas strut, you can change yourself. Um, that is one of the most neglected pieces of equipment on a lot of gliders in recent years. We have a lot of case into one gas strut failures simply because a gas strut puts everything under permanent um, tension. Um, and because of the permanent tension, you don't necessarily know play in it. So what you need to do on, from LS4s to k to ones to h 20s is when you open the canopy, a bit fully open, then push the, the edge, the top edge of the canopy up further and see if there's any play in it. And most of them, even brand new gliders that have done a couple of thousand flights being brand new, have some fairly horrific amounts of play in them. And we've got some photos later in the presentation where you'll see what that causes and so on. But yes, please keep the play out of your canopy gas struts. Um, all, all the um, uh, gubbins you'll find goes in that. We'll show you later. Right. Um, wing skids, you can change those. You can change your water balance bags. You can fit your own turbulated seal tapes as per the manufacturer instructions. If you've got a um, most slider, you can change the spinner off it, the spinner on it. So, so. Um, and here's a very big one. If you have a self-sustaining glider only, I also say you can take the whole engine out and put it back in again. Now, there's a bit of a health safety culture here. I mean, if you are from an industry that um, you know, makes you mechanically very able and you, know, you, you come from a sort of quality background, so you can check all your nuts and bolts done up and everything else. The big issue of this is, quite simply, if something goes wrong, the propeller falls off or something like that, um, or the engine falls off, it could injure somebody else. So just bear that in mind. Tom. Oh, on the subject of spinners, by the way, um, they have to be balanced really well, really well. So, um, cowlings can play with those. Induction systems, you can change the air filters. Um, if the engine, you've got chip detector, um, and I'm not sure if many have in the gliding world at the moment. Um, engine oil filters you can change. Um, you can mix your own two-stroke oil. You can change spark plugs. Um, a lot of people don't understand spark plugs. There's some really good YouTube videos out there um, on aircraft spark plugs, how to actually check a spark plug. And the best thing you can do is actually use a spark plug machine. Um, and they're actually putting you, actually, you can physically see the spark and how good a spark is before you put it in the aircraft. Um, if you've got a Rotax or something like that, you can change the coolant. Um, engine controls, you make minor adjustments to non-critical controls. I'm not quite sure what that actually means, really. 
You can change engine indicators as long as they're plug and play. And the very final one, you can change the oil and the oil filter. And we'll show you a bit more about that later. So these are all the jobs that they are to say are pilot owner maintenance. So if what you want to do isn't on this list, you quite simply can't do it. So, right. Okay. Now, um, next. Here's a very big thing that's just coming in as part of the latest AASA law changes. The BJs can stop becoming uh, being a camera, continuing to have maintenance organization, probably around about 7th of December now. And then we become what's called a combined aviation uh, aviation organization. And with that, uh, we fully adopt a new AASA law called Part M Light. And what that means is, um, rather than having the entire rule book that includes airliners and everything else, uh, the, the rule book has been slimmed down to only aircraft below, below 2,730 kilos. Um, and what that means is, we no longer have to obey the same rules in Airbus obeys. The, the rules are actually a bit more proportionate. And for sailplanes only, uh, from probably December, mid-December, you will be allowed to do your own annual maintenance and, more importantly, sign the certificate of service for it. So on your SDMPs, you'll be allowed to do your own servicing and take the full responsibility for it. So, and that's coming in probably about December, mid-December. We'll be updating our paperwork um, to reflect that and uh, so on. There are some rules there, though. You can't have the ARC done on the same day. So you can do the annual, but not the ARC. Um, and there's a few other rules. Like you can't do the error directives. So we'll come back more to error directives in a minute, actually. Question. Why do some pic 20s and the HG32 not have to be white? And the simple answer is because they're allowed, uh, they've been cured to a temperature higher than 54 degrees. Ever since the mid 1960s, all composite cell planes um, were built uh, to withstand a temperature of 54 degrees uh, at all times. And they discovered rapidly that if you painted them any color other than white and took them around the world, they could go hotter. Now, what we have here is Guy Westgate kindly gave us this photograph. Because um, what he did on his glider was, and his fault, he wanted to put lots of lovely sponsor stickers on top of the fuselage and wings and everything else. And that was great, but he rapidly realized the paperwork of the glider says you're not allowed to put anything on top of the wings and so on, um, uh, because it might get too hot. So, uh, you know, being a clever bloke, he got in his airliner and made this little um, palette up of different colors and stuff. He put a uh, thermometer under each single one of them and he went to India and with outside a temperature of 33 degrees, he left it in the sunshine for a few hours, so on. And you can see here, the black one is 63 degrees, um, which is quite a lot hotter, 30 degrees hotter than the actual air temperature. Um, the Interesting enough, the white one is actually 41 degrees, and so on. Um, and you can see the various other colors and so on. Um, uh, a dark blue one is 59 degrees, and actually, the coolest one of the whole lot is the mirror um, uh, one, the vinyl, as it were, uh, that actually reflects the most heat. So that's actually one degree cooler than the white one. And if you ever want a taste test, just walk through a car park and put your hand on the um, cars and try to set the alarms off. And you really get a real feel for what they are. Um, this actually has some real world consequences. So if you're going to stick it around a container and stick it across the equator, um, you know, those containers, for whatever reason, are always painted red, dark red, which is quite a dark color. Um, if you look at, say, uh, this one, 47, you know, that's 15 degrees hotter than the outside air temperature. So if going across the equator, the temperature say 45 degrees, there's a good chance your glider is going to be 60 odd degrees in a container. Why is that a problem? Well, in the factory, it's only been cured to 54 degrees. So when it goes to 60 degrees, for a short while, it's all going to go floppy and flexible. When it cools down, if it has changed shape, it will be a different shape. It will set in the new shape. And that's why gliders have to be white uh, and so on. Um, and that's why we don't play trailers black. 
Um, because if you paint a trailer black, the glider's going to get baked permanently, um, and uh, you'll be taking the temperatures up way higher than designed to go. So a couple of gliders recently have had their back ends, I believe, cooked to 80 degrees in case there's an issue with the jet engines, but I believe the, the E-flux is um, not a big issue on those nowadays. So that's why the glider has to be white, and as a rule, that's why the trailer must not be a dark colour. Okay. Right. What you've got here is a photograph uh, we borrowed of the um, British Parenting Association. A couple of years back, the CA had a consultation wanting to ban us from using straps for more than three years. Uh, after a very unfortunate accident to a Yak-52 um, at Boston Dam, where the pilot got thrown out and uh, died as a result of his injuries. Um, and that was a, essentially a Lithuanian Russian type aircraft with a very unknown history of straps and so on. But the history of Strap Star is they started off life as cotton many, many years ago. Then the world moved on to nylon. Then the world moved on to polyester. Um, cotton um, expired extremely quickly, no matter what you did with it, because uh, it's not a man made fiber and it just decays naturally. Um, nylon was better, and polyester is a bit better yet. But polyester does degrade quite quickly. So all modern straps are generally polyester. And the parachuting community are far less regulation than us, actually, but they're very well policed. And they did a taste test, because obviously when you pull a ripcord, you know, you're actually going to put some strain on it. So um, they stuck their straps in a greenhouse for one year. So at night, had no UV exposure by day had normal UV exposure. So its breaking strain when they started was 6,738 pounds. After 80 days, first of all, can you see how it's changed color? It's gone from sort of dark black to kind of a, you know, dark gray. And it's lost over a thousand pounds breaking strain in 80 days. So that's not 24 seven member, that's just daylight. That's all. After 160 days, it's lost over 3,300 pounds in breaking strain. And you can see the discoloration. Okay. And after a whole year, it's lost nearly 4,000 pounds in breaking strain. But you can actually see the actual discoloration, can't you? Um, starts off black, and as time goes on, it gets like that. Now, Glider straps generally have a 12-year recommended life in the factory, unless you've got some made by Shroff. Um, some Shroff straps have a aero directive on them, and aero directives are not negotiable. You can never deviate from aero directive. Um, uh, some of those straps have a five-year life, and that's it, game over. Send them back to the factory and uh, hope for the best. Oddly enough, the five-year life isn't to do with the webbing, it's to do with the actual buckles. Um, I believe a Pilatus pilot in Germany got uh, expelled from one when the buckle failed, and as a result, an AD came out, um, making the Shrove harnesses non aerobatic uh, and so on. So, if you've got a Shrove harness, um, go to the Shrove website, um, go to the service documents, and in there you'll see whether your serial number and type is affected by the five year AD. If it is, it has to go back to um, Shrove, and they might do a deal with another harness, I don't know. Um, meanwhile, most people use gathering harnesses nowadays, um, and they don't have an AD on them that uh, mandates their replacement. So at the end of their recommended 12-year life, um, subject to not actually having um, any stitching coming undone, any corrosion, if it's club two-seater, you can have all sorts of sweat, vomit, and all sorts of other things spilt on it in the course of its career. Um, and the other big factor, and this is a fairly new thing to us, if it has significant discoloration, bin it. It's throwaway, uh, and so on. And what we have noticed is more and more now. There's a tendency for people to um, take their straps out of their arse gliders with their lives on it and stuff like that, and then put them in vintage gliders. Yet the vintage gliders straps are just as important as they are in the arse gliders. So please, um, all straps and all gliders must be in good condition. And if you have significant fading, the strap is actually dead scrap so, and on the Arsa ones you can only put the Arsa straps back in it but on the um, vintage gliders or, or non part into one gliders nowadays uh, you can actually use non-Arsa straps 
Um, you can get more advice from the BGA AMP section of the website. Just Google BGA AMP, and that takes you to a whole lot of documents on the BGA website that tell you how to do various things. Right. Now, something that um, Part M Light has really um, rammed down our throats is a owner's legal responsibility. Now, being an owner has got nothing to do with maintenance. Okay, there's no minimum qualification to be an owner of a sailplane. So, um, all because you might not qualify for part owner maintenance because you're not a qualified pilot, uh, that is irrelevant when it comes to being an owner. So, very much like a car. When a car, you're responsible for making sure the MOT is done, it's taxed, it's insured, and everything else. A glider is exactly the same situation. You don't have to do the job itself, but you have to make sure it gets done. And it's not used when some part of it is not legal. So if it hasn't got a MOT, you can't drive it. If it hasn't got a tax, you can't drive it. If it hasn't got insurance, you can't drive it. And so on. And the glider is exactly the same. Now, in a perfect world, you have all three of those items run out at the same time. Um, but as we know, the world's far from perfect. Right, so the first rule is the aircraft is maintained in an airworthy condition. Okay, well, that sounds fairly straightforward. Um, you've got a maintenance program as well. You should have a self care maintenance program, which helps you give some, some advice on that. You've got a um, flight manual, a maintenance manual, and so on. And hopefully, you've got some inspectors who help you as well. Okay, now it says here any operational and emergency equipment fitted is correctly installed and serviceable or clearly identified as unserviceable. Now, Remember these lists apply to things other than gliders. This applies to helicopters and normal powered aircraft below 2,750 kilos. So what's operational emergency equipment? Well, uh, it could be a if you had a power aircraft, it could be a fire extinguisher. If it's out of date, for instance, that would be marked as unserviceable or removed. If you have a emergency location transmission transmitter it's in the aircraft, um, and the battery is out of date, and the, the battery should be on the part of the maintenance schedule, typically a five-year life, then you must either remove it at five years or when it runs out or mark it as unserviceable. And it says here the airworthy certificate is valid. Now, this causes a lot of confusion because a lot of people read the rules and say, well, an airworthy certificate never, never expires. How can it not be valid? Okay. When an airworthy certificate is issued for a glider, it's non-expiring. It's only valid when you have a current arc and annual. And why is that important? Because if you crash and don't have current arc and annual, that was not a legal flight. And you know the CA might forgive you for these transgressions, but I doubt it. But the insurance companies most definitely will not forgive you. Um, and you know, that's quite a big issue nowadays. So um, there's been a lot of confusion amongst owners when this new system came in about 10 years ago. Um, a lot of them couldn't understand the difference between an ARC and an annual. They would literally go to an inspector and say, can I have a new ARC, please? And they get a new ARC. But the annual expires in two weeks' time, and that's not being renewed. So they fly for a whole year with an ARC, but no annual. Um, and so owners have to know the difference between what an ARC and an annual is and make sure they do not fly unless they're both current. Because if you do that, if you fly with one of them not current, then your airworthy certificate is not valid, even though, even though it's non-expiring. And the maintenance program has to be performed in accordance with the aircraft maintenance program specified in EASA's rules. And the BGA's STMP 267, you probably all use, um, is the EASA, what's called MIP, which is Minimum Inspection Program. And just like a car in the MOT, uh, where you take it to MIT station and you tick all those boxes on it and everything else, or they tick all the boxes on it. That's exactly what the MIP is. It's the minimum inspection program that any uh, glider can have in the system. So uh, we've not embellished it in terms of um, what to do. Um, we've put some advice in there, and so on. but that's the minimum inspection program. And the good news is the BGA were heavily involved in this system when it was being debated in the ARSA a few years ago. And of all 27 countries, um, EASA chose the BGA's then maintenance program, the 267 it's called, as the minimum inspection program. So it wasn't a big job for us to change that, but quite a few other countries have an awful lot more paperwork to fill out. So, right. Now, pilot owner competence and responsibility. So if you're going to do your own maintenance, um, that means, first of all, you can't delegate it. Um, you can't say, oh, yeah, I know how to change a wheel. I'll, I'll, I'll do it on my mate's glider. 
Okay, you might do it in your mate's glider, but you're not going to be the one taking any responsibility for it. Um, you can only do the work and sign for the work on the glider you actually own. That's all. Um, now, for club gliders, this is a bit more of an issue because at Lashen, for instance, we have 800 members and we wouldn't trust most of them to go anywhere near our gliders or take your tire and stuff like that and so on. Um, so the way that that's worked is the maintenance is managed by a maintenance manager, which is typically the club technical officer, but not always, but there should be a maintenance manager in charge of that aircraft, especially a club glider, and they decide who is competent to work on it if they're not already a BGN inspector. That's all. So there might be people, for instance, you trust to, to fix a puncture and change a tire, and there might not be. So, and that's up to the maintenance manager to, to decide that. So, uh, but the law says, and this is straight out of the law, before carrying out any pilot owner maintenance tasks, the pilot owner must satisfy him or herself. Actually, how's it very sexist on that one? They all say himself, anyway. Um, must satisfy him or herself that he or she is a competent to do the task. It is the responsibility of a pilot owner to familiarize themselves with the standard maintenance practices for the aircraft with the aircraft maintenance program. Um, and what that means is essentially, don't just guess. If you've never changed a tire in your whole life on anything, um, I'll question your competence to change a tire this time around. For instance, would you know how to take the hydraulic caliper off and get it right first time around? Would you make sure you get the brake torque stud back in the right place so when you apply the wheel brake, it doesn't rip the wheel out? So, um, if you've never had any experience of this in the in the real world, um, you need some to get some advice first. Um, I'm yet to find a YouTube video that actually tells you how to change a glider tire, but I could be wrong. If the pilot owner is not competent for the task to be carried out, the task cannot be released by the pilot owner. So that's pretty black and white. In other words, if you're confident you know how to do it, you're allowed to do it. If it's in that previous list of tasks you're allowed to do. If you're thinking, ooh, I'm not so sure, then don't give it a go. Get some advice, get a BG inspector to hopefully oversee you doing it yourself. And next time around, you can actually have a go at it yourself. Okay, now, they ask the list what you can do. They also have um, a set of rules here about what you can't do. So um, they're saying you can't do any maintenance task if it's a critical task. So for instance, they won't let you take an airline off and put it back on again. Yeah. That requires duplicate inspections. Um, it requires the removal of any major components, you know, like say an engine, unless it's a, a turbo and so on. Um, you're not allowed to do airworth directives unless the airworth directive says it's uh, specifically allowed to, to be done by the pilot and so on. Um, or a limitation item. A limitation item is something like I say, a 3,000 hour check. That's where the, the, an item has a life subject to inspection or overhaul. So if, say, you've got an SB20 that's your 3,000 hour check, you are not allowed to sign that sign for that on pilot owner maintenance. That has to be done by a proper BJ inspector. Um, and an airworth directive. So if you've got a standard sewer, say, and it has hotelier couplings on it, um, then hotelier coupling uh, has a airworth directive on it that says every year you check how round the balls are to make sure they haven't worn out and they're still spherical. So, uh, and that's an airworth directive, and you have to use a calibrated vernier to do that. It says you can't uh, do work that requires calibrated or special tools, uh, basically the same as item three. Um, of course, use of test equipment uh, like NDTs. So, if you had, say, like a Kestrel, um, a Things Kestrel that is, uh, it hasn't been modified with the glass Lugal system um, sold by Stryfenader, um, every year Kestrels have a requirement to do a die penetration test on the rudder drive at the back. Because um, I know from experience, as a very young inspector, when the rudder falls off, it's not good news. Um, and Interesting enough, if you have a uh, things to be rudder drive, Streifenader in Germany will happily make you up a Imperial one for your glider for price. So uh, you're not allowed to do anything, any work if it's composed of unscheduled inspections. So if you do a heavy landing and think, oh, have I broken it or not? By all means, have a look at it yourself, but you can't sign the glider off as serviceable afterwards because that's not a scheduled inspection. A scheduled inspection is annual maintenance. If it's a powered aircraft, 50-hour um, checks, um, stuff like that, and so on. So on. Um, some gliders have 100-hour checks and bits and pieces as well, especially everything Polish. 
so on. Um, uh, if it's a powered aircraft and uh, you fly IFR, so I've got Beach Bonanza that can fly IFR, there's not a lot of I'm allowed to do to that aircraft um, in terms of the instrumentation, I can't touch it at all. And there's a various list, uh, if you want to go to the rules, the um, number eight and nines of what you can and can't do. But essentially, um, it's you know, all that lot. Um, so you can't take off any major components and you can only do schedule checks and you can't do error directives or what's called limitation items, I items having to be replaced because they've run out of life. Right, so what's the difference between say a recall of a car and an error directive? Well, I've got a seven year old golf estate and say there was a problem with the steering pump or something and the steering might stick in one particular direction, I go steering to a wall. Then VW have a recall, they go to DVLA, get all the details of who owns these gliders, uh, the sorry, cars, um, and you'll probably get a letter from them saying, take your car to a garage to have a free fix of this problem. Now, if it's a glider, it's a completely different story. In fact, not a glider, any aircraft actually. Um, they issue what's called an aero directive. And there's a few different types of aero directives. There's the emergency aero directive that grounds an aircraft immediately. Right, do it now, don't fly it again. Um, it's a bit like the 77 Maxes had on them. Um, or there's more normal aero directive where in the aero directive, it tells you how long you have to comply with it. So for instance, at the moment, um, there, if you own an early um, Nimbus 2, Janus A, the all-flying version of the Mini Nimbus or standard series, uh, right now there's a proposed AWO directive coming out on that one, and that will probably say when it comes out that you have 90 days to comply with it when it comes out. And that's making sure um, that you put markings on the tailplane to make sure you know when the uh, tailplane is locked onto the glider. So, and the problem with aero directors are, is you pay for them, nobody else. And in quite a few cases, people bought brand new gliders and three, four months later, aero director comes out. That's not covered by the warranties in most cases. So just bear that in mind. If an aero director comes out, it's down to you. And these can be quite expensive, um, but nonetheless, they're usually very important. Uh, things like having to change a pylon, a propeller and stuff like that can easily cost thousands of pounds. Um, but when you look at the photos later on and you understand uh, how they come to be, you know, aero directors are normally you know, very relevant and need to be done. Uh, what I strongly recommend you do is, and we'll try and show you in a minute, is uh, sign up for the ARSA website um, as well. And that way they can email you aero directors for your type of glider um, very clearly. Um, Luke, can you take us to the Slyco website? And what I'm going to do now is whenever you're doing annual maintenance, uh, of a glider, um, uh, there's a requirement to check error objectives. And there's two places for that, the ARSA website I'll show you in a minute, and the other one is the Slyker website itself. So in this case, we go to Slyker Aircraft, in English, and we look at, say, K21. So that's some aircraft types, and that. So we go and scroll down to, say, the K21, because the, on these websites, you don't just have error directives. So we then scroll down a bit, and then Luke, if you can zoom in, please. So, and in this case, um, did you know two weeks ago, they issued a technical note on the KFM to one? This is not an error directive. It's what's called a product improvement. Um, and the way it works, an error directive quite simply points you towards a technical note on a usually a global website, and that tells you the working instruction of what to do. Um, technical notes can also, in fact, more often not, are product improvements. So in this case, two weeks ago, Slyke has issued a technical note on the Caden to one um, telling you that their old brake hoses that have a six-year life um, you know, can be replaced with a new type of brake hose made of Teflon that has no life. And that's a pretty good mod, I'd suggest. If you've got an old K21 with an old brake hose and so on, um, it's worth spending probably not a lot of money on giving it a new brake hose that has no life on it. Um, so, on. so that's just a typical example. So every annual arc um, and periodically, I suggest you go to your sort of manufacturer's website of the glider um, and log in and just check to see if there's anything coming out. Because quite often something does come out. You think, why is that not an error of directive? You know, 
was that prepared to fall off? And, you know, is that not important? Um, but it is true. Occasionally, it's strange what becomes a, a technical note, thinking well, that's good information, it isn't always an OM objective. So this isn't deemed to be a major safety issue. So this is not an OM objective, it's just a product improvement. Okay, um, but check them every time. And here's the ARSA website. Let's zoom in, please, Luke, on the top left side. And I recommend you all sign up to this. Um, now, as you can see, looking down, this talks about air buses and stuff like that. Whenever a air objective comes out from a cell plane to an airliner, um, uh, it will come from here. We get no pre-notification of it, no more than you do if you sign up to this. So in here, there's a user guide. Go up to that and sign up um, with your glider manufacturer and everything else and get that. So um, if you've got a Phoebus or something, you're a bit unlucky there because you have to sign up to Airbus because Airbus support the Phoebus still. And that means you get all the broken toilet lid seats and that sort of thing that's actually quite often divert flights. So it's quite important. Great. Okay, back to the presentation, please, Luke. Okay. And Chimp Perf have a pretty good system um, uh, because what they have is actually... Uh, Okay, I've just lost the presentation somewhere. Okay, um, Shemperv have a system where you log in and you just enter your serial number and it brings up all the relevant paperwork to your glider. So it's really quite good. EASA website only has error on it from 2007 onwards. Beyond that, you're stuck on the manufacturer's websites as a rule. Um, the CA will be, the CA do have a website for error directives, but it's not very user friendly, I'll say that much. Um, we won't follow this, but um, when you that, if you want to download uh, this afterwards, here's some links to some good places. Then we haven't shown you so far is the BGA Compendium. Um, and Luke, if you can go there, please. The Compendium doesn't have Airworth directors on it for gliders that are supported by the manufacturer. Um, but what it does do, it has the operational history of gliders. And of course, what problems have we found? on these gliders and in the compendium we, we have it's just about every glider in the bj system and all the known defects we've ever had so here we have slightly composite gliders and we start off with the sw12 and their biggest defect was they didn't have any air brakes um and then we go down to the k21 and this goes back all the way back to 1974 typically and in there um just zoom in a bit more please luke uh, you can see these are all the problems we've had with K21s since they first came into the system. Um, actually, there are a few more problems. I haven't updated it for a while. But not in there yet. And on the right-hand side, there's something called TNS. And if you Google BGA space TNS and so on, that takes you back to all our engineering news sheets going back to 1974 and so on. And... If, for instance, uh, you're thinking, oh, what happened on the new sheet number one, 2014? If you go there, you get all the details of what's in there. And nowadays, um, every few months, I send the new TNS round. Um, it's a warts and all explanation of what's gone wrong um, with some gliders, a list of air directives, uh, as well as often photographs of defects we found and stuff like that and so on. So um, I strongly suggest um, you can try and get yourself on that distribution list for the uh, TNSs as well. So, right, if you can go back to the presentation, please, Luke. Okay. So, right, let's talk about stress. Anyone feeling stressed at the moment? Anything furloughed, lots of jobs, and so on? Well, just think about a glider. That makes you feel a bit unstressed. It does for me anyway. Right. Um, there's a number of different types of stress in a glider. We have bending loads, we have torsional loads, we have compression, we have tension, that's a big form of stress, and shear. And what we're going to show, we'll show you some examples of all those um, types of stress on the glider and how it works. So, on. so um, bending loads is exactly as you say, uh, as it says. It's quite simply, you know, putting something over knee, bending it, and you know, it bends around one point. A torsion load is how torsionally stiff something. So if you get a box, which is a square box, and twist it one into the other, a box isn't very twist, isn't very um, stiff. But if you get a toilet roll and twist it from one into the other, a tube is very stiff. And that's really important when it comes to glider wings. Compression. 
That's when a buckling load is applied to something. So, so if you apply a buckling load to, say, a big stick, eventually um, it's going to um, compress and go out sideways at a buckle. A tension load is the exact opposite. You get your stick and you try and stretch it as hard as you can. So on. And then a shear load is when you have a, a, a twisting, or well not a twisting load, opposing loads going through the same component. So let's give you some context to what that actually is. So here we have a big old Astier wing. Now, Astier wings are really thick wing sections, um, pretty strong. And what we have here is the D-box. Now, imagine this D-box is half a toilet roll. And what they've done is we've quite simply built a frame into it halfway long. So if that was a square wing, okay, that would be really torsionally unstiff. But because it's um, a D shape with that in it, it's actually very stiff. So, um, and why is that important? Well, in a moment, I'm going to show you a video about flutter. And there's a few different types of flutter. We're, we're going to you, show you a flutter caused by lack of torsion rigidity. So what would make this Astier wing lose its torsion rigidity? Say damage on the leading edge here. The leading edge is the very thinnest part of the wing. So if that was cracked and so on, it would flex more. Big dents in the top surface or lower surface near the root of the wing reduce the stiffness of this wing. Whereas a dent in the wingtip is less important because there's not much left wing left to take the stress. So, so yeah. Right. What you can see next is a flutter video uh, made by NASA. Um, and this is actually a Piper uh, Twin Comanche, who's doing some information mules in these. And when we play it, I want you to look at the tailplane very, very carefully. So, this pilot is taking it uh, quite a long way above VE. And the, they've done some calculations, obviously. They know which bit's going to flutter first. And you'll notice, look at the root end of this in particular when it goes. Look at the root end of the tailplane as it starts to flutter. So look at the root. Let's how the root starts going up and down in a moment shortly. So that's lack of torsional rigidity so causing that. So any damage to a D-box can cause that sort of flutter. So, right, Luke, um, I think I can go on myself, great. Okay, okay. now here's another flutter video. Um, this is control caused by uh, lack of control mass balance. So slightly different mode. Um, and this glider, for those of you interested in history, the SB9, built about 1969 by German Ackerflieg. Um, and in those days, they were just starting off with glass fiber, really, really trying to figure out how it all worked. And okay. this is the wing going up and down. And what they've done is they've taken all the control mass balance off. So the controls are, are very trailing edge heavy. And they're only doing this at 90 kilometers an hour. It's not fast, I forced like 50 knots, that sort of area. And this is what it does to the glider. This is a 90, no, 20 meter glider um, called SB9. And that's it happening in real time. And that's caused by not enough mass balance on the ailerons. The stick is going left and right, left and right in the cockpit. And this how the fin is going left and right, left and right, and so on. You really can see some you know, good torsional stress stress is going down here. That's one of the reasons why the fuselage is around. Back to the toilet, toilet roll theory again. If it's round, it's more torsionally rigid, so you get less less um, flexing. Okay, so this is it slowed down by a factor of three and a half. So look at those ailerons being driven up and down by the lack of mass balance and the Pilot, all he has to do is stop this. Is actually probably grab hold of the stick and hold it as tight as he possibly can, and fly probably a bit slower. So, if you had a control surface that had too much weight on the training edge, this is the potential that can happen. Okay, and what we do now is we, we they, they they then fly faster again. And th this is quite scary. This video. So, and they're doing this at 140 kilometers an hour, which is what, about 72, 73 knots? Okay. 
And when you see the video, notice how they're, they're not exactly doing it in open countryside either. You know, they were very, very confident this glider wouldn't fall to bits. In most gliders, if you had this ha happen, you would have an instant hinge, hinges breaking off, um, plus probably wings failing, tail planes failing, all sorts of things can go wrong with this. Okay. And there it is, real, in real time. And then they, they slow it down by a factor of three and a half. So that slowed down by three and a half. And you can see this glider had really beefy hinges. You can actually see the hinges underneath as well. So, and all the pilot's doing, he's like 140 knots, and he's quite simply knocking the stick, taking it out, he's having it trimmed, but he's just knocking the stick, and the stick is going left, right, left, right, left, right, driving the wings. So, um, good reason not to fly your hand off the stick in turbulence. You can, could actually kick or flutter. Okay. And then they do the same test again, but they fit the mass balances back. So you then knock the stick off and it just damps itself out after three or four cycles. So he knocks the stick and it just stops. So that's the view from behind. Okay. Okay. So that's why um, in your maintenance manual, uh, you'll notice if you go down through that, you'll see a big section on mass balance of control surfaces, rudder, elevators, flaps, stuff like that, and so on. Um, it's not on most of the wooden gliders, apart from the Polish wooden gliders it's on, actually. And so if you're thinking, oh, I'll just repaint an aileron, you've got to weigh it first and uh, check all mass balance first, and that really does require good calibrated equipment. So repainting a control surface will be beyond pilot owner maintenance. But if you want to do it or need to do it, uh, you can do it, subject to getting oversight from a BJ inspector. So, um, but there's a lot of uh, factors to do other than just repainting the control surface. So here we have a SW20 spar web. Now, what I like about this, it actually shows the spar caps and so on. Um, now, back in the 90s, we did lots and lots of spar repairs to various gliders and so on, including her 220s actually. And the first thing that always surprised me was, the top spar cap was always thicker than the lower spar cap. But why is that? Now, um, those of you who know anything about glider stressings, the um, gliders are built to a standard that's nowadays called CS22. So if you ever get bored, Google CS22 in EASA, and you'll have a, uh, go for version three, and you'll have about 150 pages on how uh, they test a glider uh, to new build standards and so on. So it has all the, the requirements for certification in that document. So, um, and gliders are certified in what's called the utility category, mostly. In other words, they're strong enough to do basic aerobatics. That doesn't mean to say they're actually allowed to do basic aerobatics, because gliders like a Joe Discus doesn't have speed limiting air brakes in a 45 degree dive. It's only in a 30 degree dive. And that means it's not allowed to do aerobatics, even though it's strong enough to do aerobatics. Um, and typically, in flight, a glider is allowed to pull 5.3 Gs positive, and I seem to pull about 2.65 negative. So why the big disparity? Why can you go a lot more positive G than you can negative G? And the simple answer is, in a normal 1G environment, and so on, the buckling loads, the compression loads on this bar are very significant. This spar cap, under extreme load, is trying to pull itself, shear itself off that, spar, that web below it. So on. Now, in this case, this is a whole lump of rotten wood, actually, which is why you need to store your SB20s in nice, nice, beautifully ventilated trailers. And so, on. Um, so on. And this top spar cap is trying to buckle off. Now, the lower spar cap is the exact opposite. So this one's being scrunched together, pushed together, and buckling, and the lower one's being stretched. Stretching is actually a far easier load to cope with. Um, you, you don't need anywhere near the same width of spar cap to take the tension loads. So in this case, um, if you then flew the glider inverted, uh, you'll then be in minus one G environment. And you're only 1.65 G from having a wing fall off perhaps, or, or certainly damaging it if you're inverted. Whereas upright, you've actually got uh, 4.7 Gs, or well, 4.3 Gs tolerance and so on. So the top spar caps are typically much thicker than the bottom spar caps for normal 1G um, flight. Um, for a acrobatic glider, 
Um, usually you'll have a uh, top spar cap be massively thick, but the glider is just as aerobatic um, either way up and so on. But uh, I think the only glider that comes close to that is the Fox, uh, maybe the Swift. Um, but all the other gliders like Pilatus and so on, they're actually uh, a bit more like this. So the poor old shear web is the bit that goes between the top spar cap and the lower spar cap. So the, the top one and the lower one's going in different directions, and the poor shear web has to resolve those issues. Hence, rotten wood is quite bad news, especially on this bit of the spar. Um, so you know, please look after your spars. Um, don't let them go rotten, because it's quite a serious issue. Um, this is a repair of that one, um, and you can see why it suddenly gets expensive, because the... Um, actually, I'll just go back a bit. You know, by the time you've replaced that wooden spar web, um, you can't just slap the glass fibre over it right to the edge. You actually have to blend the join in. And the way it works, say you have seven or eight layers of 9140 glass fibre, whatever it is, you have a fixed length of blending or splicing, as we also call it, um, uh, to which you've got to fade the glass fibre in, the new glass fibre. And quite often, um, that exceeds the space available. So in this case, uh, they've had to cut away the root ribs to get the blending or the splicing distance in there. So the actual spar repair itself isn't too bad, uh, but the moment you start having to unpick root ribs, that becomes a massive repair. Um, and in reality, nowadays, I'll, you know, I'll suggest that's probably not economically viable, actually. Um, so. okay. And here's a picture of Nash 25, one of my favorites, which shows most of the bending, compression, tension loads actually in flight. So that top spar cap there is in compression. So that's trying to buckle its way off the wing. Whereas that lower spar cap there is in tension. That's trying to that's stretching. That's not under, you know, that's uh, having quite a good time with that one. Um, the tail plane gives you permanent download. So that, you know, fuselage here, especially here, is taking a big download. And the faster you fly, the bigger the download gets. And so, on. so that's a good picture of stress. I quite like that one. So, well, I'm a fan of S25, so I've got one. Right, now, here we back. We have our Astir wing. And we have a SW20 wing. And the, there's a slight difference between the two. The biggest difference is, notice on the SW20, the main spar is on the inside of the wing. Whereas on the Astir, the main spar is actually, the spar cap is built into the skin. So I'm just going to show you the next photo. The main spar is meant to be an eye section like this. And like you know, literally girder construction for buildings and so on. And on the Astir, they put the top and bottom parts of the girder into the wing itself. And this is what most model gliders do, in fact, um, because it saves a bit more weight uh, and it makes it easier to build, a few less processes and so on. Um, and they haven't done particularly well on the Astir because that spar web is meant to be in the middle of that bit and it's not. So it's just there. So. so on. So that's how an Astir wing will works. Um, on an SW20, they do it slightly differently. They've actually built the, the whole spar in the wing. So you have the glass fiber, foam, glass fiber. This brown filler stuff is the joining agent they've used on the SW20. Um, they used a higher density foam in the middle. Uh, it's got higher density, slightly stronger. And in this case, they've used foam um, blocks. So when they join the wing together, they put the spar down, the sharp bit, bits of resin don't punch the water bath bags. It's as simple as that. Otherwise, you always want excess resin squeezing out. If you don't have excess resin, it probably means there wasn't enough resin there, and that's actually far worse than having too much. Um, the advantages of the SU20 type spar, though, is you probably get less shrinkage over time. And if you look at the bottom of the picture, you can also see the what happens when the sandwich between the foam and the glass fiber breaks down. So when the foam comes unattached, the foam gets broken. So from the this is what's called the inner skin, and that's the outer skin. The whole thing breaks down and, and just shatters. The whole thing relies on not being delaminated. Um, so dents uh, with delamination are really bad news. We'll more about this a bit later. So um, right now we're going to do a what's known as a tap test. This is a Joe Discus, and the there's a dent actually over top of the spar. So it's a bit like the SU20. Um, and how do you know a dent's important? 
Well, we're going to show you a tap test, and tap tests are not about just finding whether something's come unattached. It's also for finding like where spars are. Um, we had a chap a couple of years ago who accidentally drilled a hole for a PIC-20 spar when he was drilling holes in it to take out the rusty controls, um, you know, which is a common thing, unfortunately, a lot of gliders, not just PIC-20s. Uh, and he measured it up perfectly, cut a hole for one wing, got access to controls, then transferred the same measurements onto the other wing, forgetting that the spars are staggered and accidentally nicked the spar whilst cutting a hole in it. Um, and if you come an experienced glider repairer, you rapidly learn that drawings of gliders and what actually happens in real life are not the same thing. So before you ever cut a hole in something, you always do a tap test to make sure you're not going to cut a hole through a rib or a spar or something like that. Um, but this particular test shows you where the main spar is on a glider, and it also shows you um, how we test a dent to see if the dent is delaminated. In other words, has the foam become unattached and that part of the glider is no longer part of the sandwich? It's on. Um, it's on. Right. So here we have, here we have a, a duo discus wing, and same for its annual inspection. And the inspector's notice there's a dent um, on the wing, on the top surface, right above the main spar. So, what he's now going to do is um, do a tap test to hear if it's delaminated and also where the main spar is relative to the dent. So which is, go ahead and tap please. Turn your volume up by the way. So you can hear there the difference between the spar and the skin. So that's the where the back face of the spar is. Mark with a pencil. Where you hear that tone change, that's where the front face of the spar is. And now you can see where the dent is. And if you hear that tone change, that's the middle of the dent. And you hear a big change there. And that's where the outer skin of the wing skin is no longer attached to the foam inner. The only way to repair that is to remove the skin and replace it. Right, hopefully you um, got the volume high enough and you could hear the tone change. Um, in that photo, I won't bother now, um, the important thing is if you ever have a dent in your wing, um, do it a tap test and if it's delaminated in the middle, that means it's broken. Um, what's the tolerance for broken parts? Well, if it's at the D-box, in the D-box, and it's anywhere near the root end, there is no tolerance if it's delaminated. If it's right at the outer foot or two of the wingtip, it's probably less of an issue. Um, what causes dents? Bad trestles. Um, gliders left on trestles outside, trestles in workshops, stuff like that, and so on. Um, dents in any glider with a balsa core are really bad news because the balsa core tends to... When you dent it, um, it tends to shatter the inner skin, quite often for a few feet either side of the dent. So where you have a dent in the glider of a balsa core, like an SW15, Kestrel, LaBelle, SW17, those sort of gliders, you've got to get inside the wing of a camera and have a look at the inner skins. Um, this was the um, duo discus, the dent, when they took the ground the glass fiber off, and you can see the different layers here. Um, you've got a tiny little very thin layer there. You've got a layer of the filaments going that direction. And then the next layer is the filaments going that direction. And the foam core itself, it's only about eight millimeters thick typically. So, um, the question is, how do you know the foam core is not shattered or broken? And the only answer is really is to take it out. And um, then you insert a new piece of foam core. And then we can splice new bits of glass fiber in. Um, and then we cook it for typically 15 hours at 54 degrees. Grind it all back and paint it white again. So, uh, so that would be how to fix that. That would be well beyond the scope of pilot owner maintenance. So, right. So to qualify to be a pilot owner, there's some ARSA rules on this. Okay, uh, you have to hold a valid pilot, pilot's license or an equivalent. So, what's an equivalent of a pilot's license? Well, in the BJ system, that'd be a bronze, bronze or above, and it's not bronze cost endorsement. It's just a bronze. So if you hold a bronze 
in the BJ system, you are deemed to be fit to be a sailplane um, pilot owner or who can do maintenance. Um, if you haven't got a bonds, then you can't do anything unless it's under supervision. Okay, And the pilot license on the aircraft that doesn't involve gliders doesn't count. So if you've got, say, a helicopter ATPL, that does not count for maintaining a glider because it's got nothing to do with gliders. So, okay, You must own the aircraft, um, either as sole owner or joint owner. Um, okay, uh, you, There's various other rules here. I'm not going to go into any great detail. Read it yourself afterwards and so on. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff. But essentially, you have to be licensed on gliders, a national license, a bonds is the equivalent. So, and you must be an owner of that glider. And being in a club that owns that glider is good enough. Okay. What is not maintenance? This, this sounds a bit strange. What's not maintenance? Any task is in the flight manual. Okay. So, for instance, if you've got a Ventus Turbo, as an example, or DG1000 Turbo, or motor glider, whatever, and so on, um, it says before every single flight, you will check the engine pylon and propeller and hubs and all those little bits there for cracks. Um, that's not maintenance. That's part of the DI, even though um, it's not something that you'd normally do, perhaps. Assembling the glider, putting the wings on, doing anything like that, uh, mixing fuel, filling up the fuel tanks, um, you know, oil, all that sort of thing is not maintenance. Okay, that's just part of the routine of you know, having a glider. So anything's in the manual, you'd have to do that. Okay, so why is that important? Because maintenance, as that list I showed that list earlier, whenever you do one of those tasks like changing a tire or wheel you have to sign what's called a certificate release to service. When you're doing a task that's in the flight manual, it's not maintenance. So you can just write it in the iBook, you know, pump tire up or something, um, so on. That's not maintenance, pumping a tire up. Putting more oil in it is not maintenance. Um, inspecting your engine pylon for cracks is not maintenance um, if it's part of a DI. And so on. But you know, if you're going to do, say, um, inspect your pylon as part of your annual maintenance, that's different. You, know, you need to sign what's called a certificate release to service. Okay. So, what is a certificate release to service? It's a legal document. It's a statement in the ARSA system uh, that when you finish the maintenance, um, you're going to write out a, a, this release to service and you have to write it into the aircraft logbook and onto what's called a worksheet. More about worksheets in a minute. So on. And it's a very, very specific thing you have to write. You don't just say, annual, done, sign here. It's not as simple as that. You have to state what you've done, like annual, accomplished, see worksheets and so on. And then you have to state what rules are you paying whilst doing that annual. Um, so on. so uh, if you ever look at the BGA worksheet at the bottom, we have the latest versions of wording from AR, so each time we do that. So for a pilot owner certificate, you're referencing rules 801, 201, 801 again, um, uh, and uh, 803. And you'd have to write in the logbook, this certifies that limited pilot owner maintenance specified, a set of otherwise specified, was carried out in accordance with part ML, that's um, part M light. And in respect to that work, the aircraft is considered ready for lease to service. That's a legal statement. You have to put that in the logbook. And so, on. so if you're going to change the tire on the glider, you have to basically write this into the logbook. You know, change tire in accordance with the, that stuff below. So it's a bit wordy, I know, but that's the joys of aircraft maintenance. Okay, and um, there's a few other rules as well. Um, you can only sign a CRS on the work that you have done. Um, so technically, legally, you're not allowed to sign for something your mate did and so on. Um, you can only do it on the glider you actually own. Syndicate aircraft owned, you're allowed to, you have a lot more freedom. Um, and if you don't have a medical, um, but you do have a license, you're still deemed to be a pilot owner, even if that license essentially isn't valid because you have, so you've got to say an SPL that's only valid with a EASA FCL medical um, in some cases. Uh, then if your medical expires, they still deem you to be a licensed glider pilot, even though technically your license not might not currently be valid. So, so the rules are quite flexible and very user-friendly in that respect. 
Okay, so you must enter this different piece of service in the logbook and on the worksheets as well. So, so what's a worksheet? Luke, can you blow it up, please? So, um, this is the BJ worksheet. So if you just type into Google BGA space 205, um, you'll find this on the BJ website. Um, and uh, in here, you write registration, aircraft type, if you have a filing system, what it is, what data it is, what you're doing, like tire change, sheet one of how many pages you've got. Then you list each task as you do it. So on, and I'll show you an example later. And at the bottom of the sheet, we have three different types of what's called CRS. Um, and I really blow it up a lot so you can see them too far, actually. Okay, we've got three boxes here. Now, it's, one says Annex 2, and Annex 2 is the non AASA aircraft. Now, um, come Brexit, uh, the word Annex 2 is going to be dropped out of the system, and they then be called non Park 21 aircraft. But at the moment, we tend to call them Annex 2. Technically, they're now in the AASA world, these are Annex 1 aircraft. Um, and so after uh, New Year, they then be called non Park 21 aircraft. So that's things like vintage aircraft or things to be T 61s, in my case, a chipmunk. Then you have AASA aircraft that are being signed for by a BJ inspector or Park 66 engineer. And you can see here we have a whole li um, list of uh, uh, rules you have to apply BJ's approvals, MF 007, for instance. And then we have ULOT where if you're going to change the tire, you write your details on here the same way any other engineer would, and you tick the pilot owner box, and the pilot owner's recently service um, has a basic set of words. You then sign it. So you put down your B, your authorization number. So if it's a bonds, your certificate number. If, it's a, if you've got a license, your license number, and your date. And um, you then put a copy of this document into the aircraft maintenance file and you also have then have to write essentially the pilot owner CRS bit into the logbook as well so you know, so an arc, arc engineer comes along uh, the arc man can be, there's, no, there's no doubt there's been pilot and maintenance on it and you might want to look at that to come up time that's largely up to them though so. right Luke can we move on please that's great so, you're changing your tire. Um, something that, as a glow repair, I've done many, many, many hundreds of times. And a very common issue is, you see the space a bit in the middle. The number of times I've taken the wheel to bits to find the space is missing. If it has no spacer in it, it means it's missing. It's not a case of, oh, they didn't build a spacer into it. It's been lost. Um, and what that means is, if you do a good sideways landing, there's a much better chance that your wheel bearings are going to get punched into um, the wheel. Um, these are the wheel bearings. So the spacer transfers the load, keeps the whole lot solid. Whereas without that spacer, a good sideways landing and these wheel bearings don't take much of the way side loads. You can actually um, take the bearings out. So just bear that in mind. So, um, and what would the paperwork look like for changing a tire? Well, when you buy a tire, um, and the best company usually we use is a company called Watts Tires. Um, they've got a brilliant website that educates you on how to, um, what a tire is about, how the sizes work and stuff like that and so on. Now the tire will usually come with an answer form one if it's a main wheel tire. So on tail wheel tires tend not to, but the main wheel tires do. Um, oddly enough, it's very hard to buy a tube for tire with an answer form one on it. They come with a different conformity and you know, your AASA Form 1 and Certificate Conformity perform, um, form part of the work pack for your uh, changing entire paperwork and so on. Okay. Oh, another thing. Glider manuals are atrocious. They often, they might, if you're lucky, tell you what size the tire is for your glider. What they won't get to tell you is the profile of the tire. Because tires, a 5 to 5 tire can come like in a square shape, a round shape, um, a half round shape stuff yet only one shape actually fits your undercarriage and i've seen a number of situations where people have bought the right size tire but it has the wrong profile and they then start sawing bits out the glider trying to figure out why it doesn't fit or you know a bit like um uh, in some cases tail wheels people buy 200 by 50 square tires 
um, or, or two Tempest 65 square tires, and all they do is they grind away the mudguard. So it's not just about the right size, it's also about the right profile of tire. And um, Watts Tires is a great um, website of telling you um, how profiles work. So, um, right, if you can just uh, browse up, please, Luke. And this is a uh, worksheet for changing a tire. So, and we will be a little bit anal about this one and going through it. So, in this case, aircraft registration, aircraft type, has 25, date, what you're doing, tire change, one of two sheets. Why is it two sheets? Because the second sheet is the ISO form one. So, defect, tire's flat. Check it, found it, was punctured. Right. So, I need to remove the wheel. Okay. Jack up the glider. Okay. Um, remove the wheel brake caliper. You, on most gliders, you can't just remove a wheel. You've actually got to remove the wheel brake system as well. Um, take the caliper off. Glad the wheel's removed. Um, wheel's often full of mud, needs cleaning anyway. Um, and the, in this case, the wheel cleaned and degreased. Tire needs replacing, so always, no matter health and safety, take the valve core out, even if you think the tire is flat. Just a couple of PSI can make it make it explode in your face. So no matter what, you make sure you have in your toolbox a bicycle repair kit with a valve core um, for a shredder valve. Most of them have it's on, so you take the whole valve out, uh, valve core out, and that way it can't blow up in your face. Um, take it out, make sure it's fully deflated. Um, take it all out, clean it up, um, check the bearings always as well. Um, make sure they aren't 50 pence pieces, put your fingers in, make sure the bearings go round, um, because then that's a good time to change those as well if there's a problem. Uh, refit the tire, make sure it's got leaks, no leaks, put a creep mark on it. Um, refit the wheel brake caliper uh, as well. And also, when you fit the wheel brake caliper, um, part of the job is to make sure you pump the wheel brake up afterwards. because. To take the caliper off, you usually have to push the piston in. And if you then just refit it um, and go and fly it, it'll probably take about six or seven pumps of the air brakes before the caliper actually starts actuating the wheel brake again. And we genuinely have had accidents where people have been putting the air brakes fully back with no wheel brake um, because after the tire has fitted, they haven't pumped it back out again. So part of the fitting the tire is also making sure the wheel brake works properly afterwards as well. A um, bit about parts used, and then at the bottom, uh, the owner has to sign it using the pilot owner box, name, in this case an SPL license number, and the date. Okay, Luke, you can get rid of that now. So that's the paperwork you need for ch changing a tire. Okay. Right. Bit about um, refinishes. We have a trend of um, horrible old gliders. Um, being neglected because they're not worth anything. You know, typically an SV15 that needs a refinish. If you took it to Slovenia, um, Aerosport or something like that, it would probably, probably cost you 10, 12, 15 grand. That's the way to refinish it. The glider worth 5,000 pounds. It's not worth 5,000 pounds because you've got to spend 10,000 pounds to keep it airworthy. Um, people have to get it into their heads that when a glider needs a refinish, it needs a refinish. The fact it's not worth it is irrelevant. That means the glider's scrap. Um, so please watch this short video uh, on refinishing. Glider refinishing Glider is always a bit of a contentious subject. Contentious. It's going to cost many, many thousands of pounds to do it properly. Because if you're refinishing the glider because it's cracked, every single piece of gel coat and filler and everything else associated with the cracks has to come off. Um, the cracks are never just in the surface. They always go full depth, and if you don't take it all off, they always come back. Because um, it is so expensive, it tends to get put off and put off and put off. And quite a few cases get put off too long until the glider actually has quite substantial amounts of damage to it. Um, in the following photos and um, video from Richard Killam and so on, you'll see some of the damage caused by leaving it too long to fix all the cracks and problems they cause. Um, it's usually a false economy to leave it that long because it makes the refinishing job much tougher. As you see, it involves having to re-glass the wing and then cook the wing at 54 degrees for 15 hours, which is quite an undertaking. It increases the cost quite substantially. So please, refinish them before the cracks get too bad. Okay. Cracks are on the lower surface of the wings. They went through the gel coat and they're actually here all the way along.
the main area to be addressed is on the, this is the lower surface of the starboard wing and the cracking goes from the root up to the aileron inboard rib. So here we have a K71 wing, I think, being refinished, um, and it's having to have the top layer of two glass arbor replaced, which really adds a lot of money to the refinish, a lot of extra labor. You can completely destroy the profile of the glider and have to start again. So please refinish it earlier rather than later. Okay. Oh, sorry. Mic back on. Um, so here we have a LaBelle um, and the pilot uh, was Mike Fox. He owned it and when he went to V&E, he found that his LaBelle you're just a little bit more than other LaBelles. Um, and on investigating it, eventually found it to be broken. And then what he did, we brought it back down to Lasham and we went through the finger of fine tooth comb, basically trying to make an idiot's guide on how to find damage on the bells. But in reality, the lessons are relevant to any glider. Um, Luke, if you can please play the video. In this video, we are going to try and show you how to find hidden damage in a label. At v &E, the pilot reported it yawed a bit more than other labels he has flown. This justified having a very close look and listen at the fin. We tried to film it. First, we rigged it in the hangar and trestled the wings so that we could apply a force to the top of the fin without it rolling in its belly dolly. We also found another label to compare it to, although we later found that the label we were using was a later build standard with an extra layer of glass fibre in the fuselage, making it slightly stiffer by design. Nonetheless, comparing a potentially broken glider to a glider you don't believe is broken is a very valid method of seeing if the fin is stiff enough. Okay, so what you can hear here is the actually, actually the tail plane making that creaking noise. G is feeling for a bulge. Can you feel a bulge, G? Yeah, these fingers here are moving in and outwards quite considerably. In, 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 yeah. like that. But that may be normal for some gliders. We know on this one that it's actually broken and so uh, it may not be normal. So if we compare this with G's libel, uh, we'll, uh, we'll see the difference. Okay. Right. In this case, we're going to repeat the test, this time with the tailplane off, because the tailplane was making the noise previously, and I'm going to apply 10 to 15 kilos of pressure at the top of the fin, with my friend here putting his hands at the bottom and listening for the problem. And now here, the squeaky noise from the tailplane has gone. Can you feel the bowls, G? Yeah, I can feel it. It feels exactly the same. I can't hear the noise inside the fuselage. No. All so I can hear is the tailwheel moving. So you might have to put your ear against it, perhaps, G. So shall we try that? Shall we try that? And So G's got his ear against the side. Can you hear anything, G? Yes. Right. Yeah, I can hear it creaking. So we've got this, we've got this microphone against the side here. Let's see if we can record the, uh, the creaking. Now 
around this side, the bowl is really obvious. From where I'm looking. Let's have a look, Mike. Just so see from where I'm looking. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, Gordon's um, putting about 10 to 15 kilos of pressure on the fin. Yeah. And as we can see, um, G can very, very easily feel the bulge in his hands. Um, visually, it's not so easy to see, but you can probably just see his thumbs bulging in and out with a few large, it's just a bit too flexible. Certainly justifies a closer internal inspection. Well, I've put my hands around like that. You can see the thumbs, the ball of my thumb moving in and out relative to the top line of the fuselage. However, of course, you can't see anything on the outside of the, the fin if G just took, took his hand There's off. No cracks. Her. No cracks. Might be difficult to see on the video. There's no evidence on the outside at all except the flexing of the tail. And that's with the glider <laughs> trestled up. That's the only way to do it. We did not detect this when we um, when we had it just with the fuselage out. We had to trestle it up and that's when we started hearing the, the crinkling noise and started to see it really flexing like that. Right, because otherwise it tends to flex, it just moves in the dolly. Yeah. And creates too much noise and is not stiff enough. Yeah. Here we're going to repeat the check. This is a different label. It gives us a very good comparison. Now, it appears to be stiffer when we do this, but we're, now we'll just check for sure. And we've got the noise monitoring equipment on it to give a direct comparison for noise. So it is and what you can hear there sorry. is, I think you can hear the tail wheel axle moving side to side. Yeah, that's what it is. Which distorts what the noise signature is going to be. And as far as feeling the movement of the fuselage, to be honest, it pretty much feels the same. It doesn't feel substantially better than the other glider. But it's a bit stiffer, isn't it? It is. It's a little bit stiffer. There's significantly less movement. Of course, this one might be broken as well, Jim. I think we need to look into it. <laughs> so what we're going to do next is we're going to look into it and show you, if you're not sure it's broken or not, how to find out. Great. So what we found was that the tailwheel was making so much noise we couldn't hear what was going on in there so we put it on a stand which happened to be the the, the, uh, the Lebel tailplane fitting. So here we are we've still got the glider rigged in the uh, in the tug hanger and we're gonna uh, stick this little £5.50 eBay camera down the back which is attached to my magnetic uh, extendable picker upper thing and you can see there the, uh, the image on my laptop that you get so let's see see the, uh, the damage in the back uh, yeah. and you can see there the, uh, the back end of the glider and the um, uh, the push rod that comes out of the, the hole in the back that uh, activates the rudder on the bell, and that's where we're going to gain access to the back to stick our stick our camera. The next video shows some of the ribs in the top of the fuselage just in front of the tailplane cutout that have broken and are tearing away from the fuselage. This is why the fin is slightly less stiff than the other label we use for comparison. It's worth noting that damage like this is much easier to spot when you're filming it while the fin is actually being flexed as it shows the movement of the broken ribs. That's looking at the that's upside down, so it's looking at go on, give it a good flex that way. That that's much more detached because it's moving most of the time. Yeah. Right. Okay. Having established the glider was broken, the job of the spectre is now done. 
The next part of the job is actually get the repair sorted out and get it to an expert in composites who understands how to do this. Um, in this case, because I'm actually a very experienced uh, self plane composite repairer, for the sake of the education, we performed a tap test and then we made sure we can cut access holes for repairs between the ribs without affecting the rudder cables, the elevator push rod, the radio cracks, or fuselage fan joints from when it was originally built, and anything else that might get in the way. We just wanted an access hole big enough to perform repairs. In cutting the access hole, we don't want to actually create more damage that requires more repairs. Where to cut the hole can be determined by looking at the glider build drawings. Uh, in this case, an internal camera is very useful. And the use of tap tests just to ensure, no matter what the drawings say, the ribs are not going to be cut when we cut this hole. But to be completely clear, this is experts only. Do not have a go at this without an absolute composite expert uh, watching over you doing this. This is not generally um, for pilot owner maintenance. I do already. Ready? Go on in. <laughs> Hang on, Andy. So we've cut holes in the side now as you can see and uh, we're just looking at the side of the fuselage uh, you can see that it's debonded from part of the, um, uh, from the from the web on the side of the uh, the former and the damage is obvious and it's the same on the other side. This was a flying glider that had not had any reported heavy landings. It had had many annuals where this damage had been missed by many experts because they were not specifically looking for accident damage. They were just performing the annual maintenance program. Most maintenance programs do not insist that you go into this level of detail at the annual um, to try and find damage. But perhaps they should. The entire composite aircraft industry is always looking at ways of making finding damage easier. I hope this video helps. A big thank you to my employers, the British Gliding Association. Uh, my name is Gordon MacDonald. I'm the Chief Technical Officer there. And also to Mike Fox. Good stuff. Right, I'm back with you now. I remember that I'm unmuting the mic this time. Um, hope you found that interesting. The techniques there are very generic. They're not stuck to label. All gliders, be it wood, metal, or um, composite, uh, those techniques are valid. It's on finding problems and damage. So please bear that in mind. Now, if you're thinking, oh, I can now go and do my own annual maintenance, part owner maintenance, please. We've got this video and a whole series of other small videos around the place. Um, you need to. Uh, look at them and in reality get the right equipment and unlike somebody being paid by the hour to do it you can spend many many hours inspecting all the nooks and crannies that wouldn't normally get to so yeah please do don't just think oh you can do an um, annual on a day if you can do a really 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 thorough job on it because you won't okay right I used to work at um, Rodard and Schneider making LS4s um, and sixes and during that time we maintained LS1s, 3s, 4s and 6s and so on and we were just making the LS7 moulds at the time and during that time um, I didn't learn a whole lot about glider repairs um, but I learned a whole lot about manufacturing and how I learned how they maintain their gliders and the first thing that LS do that is different to most of the other glider manufacturers is they mount their undercarriage on rubber bungs or these things you can see here um, these are actually torsion bar um, mounts from sort of some late 1960s German vehicle. Um, and they're rubber. And if you ever take a 10, 12 year old car to the MOT 
they say, oh, the bushings are knackered, getting perished, nothing else. A glider is exactly the same. Um, if you go into a 10, 15 year old LS1, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, um, the LS5, by the way, was an open class version in Germany. Um, the rubber starts perishing. And when it starts perishing, um, it changes shape and suddenly the undercarriage can lose how it locks and far more prone to actually collapsing. So please bear that in mind. There's also a gas strut in the system is changing occasionally. And the worst thing you can do with any LS glider is you can try and put the wheel down when there's insufficient space for it. Because what happens then, it, it shears this rubber in the undercarriage, um, which can create all sorts of problems afterwards. So a big part of the annual is looking in there. And if that's all perished and unpeeling and stuff like that, then you know, you know you've got problems. They need replacing. It's on. Now, here's the same LS4. This glider was imported from Germany. Um, and the very first inspector who did its import maintenance um, didn't spot all the damage. Um, but when it went to the second one, they certainly did. Uh, this glider was imported like this. Um, and on the annual maintenance, they looked down the back of the fuselage large and they were horrified. And the horrifying bit is this. What this is, this fuselage has been flexed very badly in and so on. It hasn't completely broken in half, but they split the whole fuselage open. And what normally happens in these situations um, is you'd probably make a mold and you'd replace that half of the fuselage. Um, or maybe you'd cut that half of the fuselage out and you'd make what's called a backing member, put that in there, and you replace that half of the fuselage. In this case, they've left all the breaks and splits and broken bits of glass fiber in the fuselage, and they've put some glass over it and put lots of filler on it. Hence, you notice how the, this part of the fuselage here is actually translucent. That part is dark, and that's because it's smothered in filler, hiding all the damage. So on. Um, and this glider, unfortunately, has a whole host of um, problems on it. Essentially, uh, these were extremely badly performed repairs that have been let go for about 20 so years by the what was probably pilot owner maintenance in Germany and nobody of any real competence actually had a damn good look inside this aircraft and so as soon as somebody did um, the damage was obvious so on so it's bad news for the owner actually because uh, you know the insurance company won't pay for damage like this so on. now this brings up another interesting subject first of all, a good view of the cracks and in inside the fuselage um, there's a number of gliders if you do a heavy landing or ground loop in them um, LS4s and 6s, open Cirruses, Ventus Bs, uh, Ventus As, for that matter, um, they have a history of the uh, control guides in the fuselage breaking. So on. Now, you know, this can happen to any glider, actually. I've seen it happen on the bells, on mosquitoes as well before now, and so on. And if you look at here on the left hand side where the light bits are, these, these are control guides, these brackets here. Can in a ground loop, as the fuselage flexes, they can come un unbonded from the side of the fuselage or just snap. And when that happens, that push rod between there and there becomes unsupported. It still works, the elevator goes up and down, and there isn't much play in it. But what there is, um, do you remember the, we showed you the video of the compression load, the spar buckling load? That's what can happen here. If you put, say, hold the stick in one position and put a download on the elevator, that one's going to want to buckle this push rod. As it buckles, it flexes, and then it flexes back the other way. And what that then does, it sets off an uncommanded elevator movement. It's flutter and so on, due to the support, the support guides being um, unsupported. So broken control guides are really bad news and have been on quite a few occasions the cause of elevator flutter at high speeds nearly always after it's been missed after that after ground loop or damage so any heavy landing or um, ground loop and so on pass that checker to get inside the fuselage with your cameras and have a damn good look at all these bits which also means it has to be clean enough to look at so, same ls4 um and this, this really had an awful lot of defects um the, the control, the nylon guide around the uh, rudder cable had, um, for whatever reason, been cut. 
uh, so on. And so the rudder cable was sawing its way through a frame coming out the base of the fin. Um, that's only meant to be a, um, a hole big enough for the nylon conduit. The rest of it is just wear and tear. Um, so, and it's just happily sawing its way through the frame of the fin. Um, again, really bad news. And the question is, if you're gonna do your own annuals, are you gonna spot this damage? And if the answer is no, you shouldn't be doing your own annuals. And so on, so please learn from this. Right, here we have a Vega. This is, you know, they're not my favorite glider, I'll be honest. Um, so uh, two years ago now, I think this one had a uh, landing in a crop field, which in itself is not a big deal. Um, we did the calculations, had about a 10G deceleration. And there was two bits of damage on it. Um, the first bit of damage was the main pin bent. Um, and that's a pain because you always, Vega, you always need a hacksaw blade and you can actually then saw out the main pins, get the wings apart. For Vega, that's a fairly common issue because we used to have them at National Club Gliders. Um, and the other problem was the battery behind the pilot's head uh, came forward um, and went through the canopy. And it's only because the pilot had fairly loose straps and got thrown forward, it didn't go through his head, was it would have made you injury. Now, in the olden days when Dick Stratton uh, was around, put pre AR, so if you ever want to do a mod to a glider, like fit a battery tray and stuff, he said, right, it must take 25 Gs in all directions. So if you've got a three kilo battery, that means 75 kilos load that battery has to take. That is considerably um, less than they asked to say. They asked to say 15 Gs. Um, the reality is I'd, I'd consider 25 Gs to be the minimum load from a crash weather standpoint they should take. Um, on the BJ website and the AMP section, if you type in BGA AMP uh, into the website, there's a whole lot of documents there on how to do things. Um, and here we have one of them called the, uh, for the battery uh, installations. And you actually see here what the ARS requirements on batteries are. Um, so on. And I would say they're hopelessly inadequate. I would not build a battery tray just to take six Gs sideways load. Um, but I have seen many occasions when batteries come out sideways after ground loops. Um, and in this particular case, uh, this was a Kestrel glider um, and the had a bow graph tray converted into a battery tray. Um, so on with bungees and bungees obviously stretch with G's and they get perish of age and so on. So if you've got an old glider now, back in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and that's the early 90s, when you bought a glider, it didn't come with a battery tray quite often. And it's up to you to design and make your own and sort it out and so on. And some of these installations haven't stood the test of time. And if you've got a battery tray like this, scrap it, start again. It has to be a lot more solid. And it's not just a battery tray, it's whatever the battery tray is mounted on as well. So a few golden rules, please try not to put battery trays behind your head. So make sure they're fused. And if possible, try not to use bungees because bungees perish with age. So right, Luke, please. That's fine. Good. Right. If you are going to do lots of work on a glider, um, you know, change tapes, you know, tires, instruments, and everything else, you rapidly run into having to use lots of worksheets. Um, in which case, you have to develop what's called a work pack. Um, and a work pack will have multiple pages, and a, a work pack with multiple pages starts off with a content sheet. Simple as that. So just bear in mind that it's on the BJ website so, on how to construct a work pack. Right, if you ever have to change an oil filter on any sort of glider, a big part of that is getting a can opener, cutting the gauze out, um, squeezing all the oil out of it, um, usually two metal plates and a vise, or just leave it drip dry for a few hours. And then you open the gauze up and see what is in that gauze. Um, this is a Rotax engine, actually. Um, and yeah, you can see it's full of metal. Um, and most four stroke engines, especially like Comings and stuff, die not because they're not working, um, they die because you find lots of metal in the filters. And that just means one thing, the engine is grinding itself to bits. And fairly shortly, maybe in 10 hours, maybe in two hours, maybe in 100 hours, it is going to fail. Um, and that's when you know you pull it, when you feel, find filters like this. Um, so, on. so any aircraft with an oil filter, unlike a car where you just change the filter, bin the oil filter, on an aircraft, you have to actually open the filters up and actually have a damn good look at them. You can buy the can openers for the aircraft oil filters from a company called Light Airways Pairs. 
Right, S220 control guides. S220 has become very popular gliders in recent times. Um, uh, and they're lovely, lovely gliders. And but they have a bit of a problem in um, the Northern Europe environment if you don't have a well ventilated trailer. So on. Um, Tim Dews, I suggest, is the, is the um, all known master for do, doing these things. Um, and this is um, Tim Dews repairing a wing. So the control guides, um, uh, in this case, uh, you have to cut seven holes in the wings to change them. That's all. And that's what they look like. And. And the what happens is, and um, they've got some videos later. You'll see they've got they're mounted on wooden ribs, and if you have an unventilated trailer, um, the whole lot goes rusty. The rivets start falling off, and so on. The control and the bearings seize on the roller bearings, and it starts grinding nice big holes into the guide. So here you have the wooden rib, and Tim has to cut the heart guides, and you can see uh, there's lots of holes down the wing. Um, that's a that's a huge amount of work. It is a man hours. Um, and on ASM 20s, uh, this gets found at two points. It usually gets found by somebody doing a pre buy inspection on it, um, or when a 3,000 hour check happens, or the owner complains it's getting very squeaky, and so on. So please, if you've got an SU20, at the next annual, get your little cameras out, stick it down the, stick it in the landing flap, and you can't inspect all the control guides, but you can usually get to see one or two of them. And if they're starting to go rusty, um, I think you know the answer. Um, and it's not a good answer because it involves 14 holes which need repairs like this. So, okay. And if you doesn't go too far, it goes beyond the metalwork and then destroys the wood. That then means the holes have to be full width from rear spar to the main spar. And that means 14 very big holes. Um, and that is really economically not worth it. That glider then becomes throw away. I think there's two in the UK right now in this state where the owners ignored ignored, ignored the noises and the obvious problems they were having there. Um, and in you know, those days, the equipment wasn't as good as it was now. And come 3,000 hour check, you look in there and you see this rusty heap of rotten wood and rusty metal and seize bearings and push rods with huge grooves in them um, and repairs on this one mean you actually have to change the whole wooden ribs and all the whole lot as well and it's just not worth it it's uh, more than the is worth so yes please nice to be 20s keep a good look at them um, and you must have ventilated trailers you mustn't you know keep them in sealed trailers so I'm right Luke back to the page please Okay, it's not just SB20s, there's other gliders as well. We had two pick 20s at a club, um, both in pick trailers built in the 70s and so on. And one was like this um, the pilot told the inspector, Come the annual, oh, the flaps are a bit stiff. Can you have a look at them? Now, if you have a look at pick 20D, they have the world's beefiest flaps of any glider ever built. Um, they're really good, it's fully aerobatic. I think being 158 knots on the pick 20Ds. Um, and it has three flap drive push rods, one of which had sheared because it was utterly corroded. So um, we looked at this one, and we looked at in the pick on the trailer next door, and the only difference, there were three serial numbers apart, both at the same riding site, and the only difference was one trailer had no ventilator on it, and the other one, for the last 40 years, had had one little round ventilator that goes round and round in the wind. And that glider was absolutely fine, all for the sake of a 50 quid ventilator um, 40 years ago. You can't undo this damage. The only way you can do this is get in there, um, treat all the metal, replace it as required, change new bearings, nothing else. It's a huge job. And we have many, many older gliders um, dying for this reason now. Um, uh, and a lot of the problem is, a lot of the gliders have 3,000 hour checks. It's too late to find it 3,000 hours. So sooner or later, we are going to develop what's called an aging aircraft program where um, unless it's had a 3,000 hour check or something like that, it will then um, be subject to a, a periodic check. Every, say every you know, 50 years or something, we're going to have to go in there and have a look at these bits regardless of how many hours it's done. Because this is not hours damage, this is age damage and poor storage. Um, 
Okay, right. This is a balsa foam wing. So I was showing you earlier the S220 and the Astia wings. This is a, I think, S215 wing, actually. And you see how you got the balsa in there. Um, quite a few gliders use balsa. Um, it's very good stuff. It's lighter. It's, you know, as a material, it's far better than the foam. Um, there's a bit of a word balsa shortage right now because wind turbine companies are using it as a core for all their wind turbine blades. Um, same way gliders are built, exactly the same, and so on. So the same technology. Um, the difference is we stopped using balsa in the 1970s and they've now rolled with it and they're sucked in the whole world of supply of balsa. So it's used on the SW15, um, no, SW12, 15, 17, the Phoebus. Um, the first few hundred bells and most of the kestrels are all balsa. Really good material, but you have to look after it. And again, the foam there was put there purely so um, when the resin squeeze out comes out, it doesn't punch the waterhouse bags and the resin goes to the back of the wing and so on. So if the resin does get damp, that the foam does get damaged, it's not a big deal and it's going to carry water ballast. But you don't leave it in there as fod. Okay. Um, here was a AD on the SP15 in the early 90s, I think it was, when I think one in some place um, had a wing clap hands uh, because fungus got into the main spar. So what they had to do was in this situation with this AD, it's a one-off AD, it's not repetitive yet. Uh, you had to basically cut a tunnel of balsa out, send it to a laboratory, have it tested for uh, fungal um, problems. If it's okay, you then injected the spa with a fungicide, put a big patch on it with a rubber bun. So if you've got an SV15 or 17 um, and you haven't got that in it, you question whether the AD has been done. Right, here's the um, situation of what's called unintended consequences. Um, we've had this happen a few times recently where people have undone nuts and bolts on various things, put them back together, but they put it in the upside down. or in uh, maybe in this situation they changed the bulk a little bit worn for another bulk that happened to be two millimeters longer and suddenly controls start banging into, into each other and getting jammed and stuff like that so please if you're ever going to undo anything even a wheel brake system or something like that photograph it, it photograph it first and put it back as you found it unless you've got a drawing a manufacturer drawing it says something different photograph it first and always put it back as you found it because often Things aren't logical, but they are that they are for a reason. Um, as you were 20s are, are dreadful for this, because often the control system will work perfectly uh, until you put it in landing flap, and it all jams up, and you have one particular bolt upside down. Right, FOD. This glider was refinished in an um, Eastern European country, and this September, when the owner took the seat out to do the maintenance, lo and behold, there was a pair of pliers. Um, contacted the company involved who, you know, uh, agreed as their pliers uh, and so on. And the simple lesson is every time you do maintenance, you need a system of knowing your tools aren't left in the aircraft. Um, yeah, this is a problem that's been going around as long as it's been aircraft. So, um, here, someone left a mirror in the aircraft. So, and we recommend that, say you're going to go to the cockpit to do something, don't just dump your tools on the bottom of the cockpit. Put them in a toolbox. If the tools don't actually go into the cockpit, they can't be left in the cockpit. So, um, and you need a system, when you finish the job, right, do a tool check. Count the tools you've used. Um, do you have a system, that maybe have a proper workshop, you have shadow boards, that's great. Um, do you have clips maybe for sockets? Spanish racks or something, or do you have a, um, a system of, right, you've taken three tools out of your box, so you put three tools back in your box. You know, there are many different systems. The important thing is you use one of them. Um, so you can account for all the tools you've used on the job. And um, a big part of at the end of every job, um, and, you know, if, uh, actually sensibly to put it in any work pack, a tool check. Make sure all the tools are not anywhere they should be put in. And it's not mandatory, but strongly recommend if you ever take the seat out, get somebody else to have a look inside the seat area before you put anything back in again. So. Right, FOD, uh, foreign object stuff, can't, isn't necessarily just um, tools and stuff. In this case, somebody's got some resin in an air brake gearbox cog. This junior um, couldn't open the air brakes fully. It had resin in it. Do you see it in the mirror? Just a bit of resin in there. Stops the air brakes opening. 
So FOD can be almost anything, actually. Um, it gets in the way. Right. In this case, that has lots of loose resin in the wing. Um, uh, actually, we'll, we won't go through that one right now. We'll get another occasion. Wheels up landings. If you have to do a gear up landing, whatever you do, do not just pick the glider up by the tail, shove it on the nose, and put the gear down. And quite a few glider types, like SV20s, 19, PEGs, um, standard series, and so on, you can do a whole lot of damage up front um, by unbonding the rudder pedals, unbonding the stick frames, and all sorts of stuff like that. So if you do a gear up landing, your options are either get lots of people around the glider and lift it up vertically um, and put the wheel down. Actually, Stefan Langer last week put a video of him doing a gear up landing in LS3 on the web. Um, web. And it shows you how much actually lifting the glider vertically put the gear down, which is a sensible way to do things. So it's a few people under each wing um, and lots of people around the cockpit, maybe set a canopy off, so on. Um, if you don't do that properly, um, things like this can happen. In this case, that's a stick frame coming unstuck. And if you do a um, gear up landing on a, uh, quite a few gliders, even if it's fairly gentle, um, the fuselage can flex out, but the wooden frames don't flex. So damage like this, wooden frame not flexing, this is actually holds the release hook on. It's really important. And many a time, people have done gear up landings in some gliders um, and broken the frames the belly hook's attached to and missed the damage. Um, it's really common on some Ventus 2s and stuff where it pushes the hook frame up into the main frame and damages it, which is quite a big welding job. So, yeah. Um, if you ever do a gear up landing, um, it's essential you take the cockpit to bits and have a damn good look at all that sort of stuff. That's not part of owner maintenance. Okay. Um, this is an SU-19. It could also be an SU-20 or Pegasus. They're all virtually the same. But the point is it's generic, any glider. Um, a lot of these gliders are now 40, 50 years old, and there's 40, 50 year old worth of muck and rubbish all at the large. Um which means if you ever have to inspect it, you can't. And in a few cases, I've had an SB15 twice now, um, where the, there was so much rubbish and grunge in the push rod, and people have actually lubricated the, the um, nylon bearings on the push rod, and then the whole elevator system seizes. Uh, and that is a pain in the art neck to fix, because what you have to do is actually, um, from the back end, you can actually get 15 foot on push rod. You have to brush lots of degrease agent around here, clean it all up. Um, and then ream it back out with sandpaper until it it's takes the push roll again. Um, so if this lot is full of mud, runs, dust, and so on, at some point, spend four or five hours just trying to get in there and get all that stuff out. Lots of vacuum cleaners and brushes on sticks and stuff like that. But do not undo the static vents, please. That gets a big problem. If a static vent ever gets water in it, don't blow it out with an airline. The best solution is make sure you disconnect it from everything and suck it out with a vacuum cleaner. Um, that's way more effective. K6Es. A lot of people don't realize the whole back end of K6Es, the skin area, is glass fiber. So if you break the, the best part of a K6E, actually it's a glass fiber skin repair, which then needs post curing 54 degrees for 15 hours, so on. Um, all wooden gliders are subject to three yearly. Um, glue checks in the BJ system, um, especially slacker gliders who have lots of carrot in them, um, and so on. Uh, so just bear that in mind. Again, it's on the BJ website. Engines. Um, virtually every aircraft or traction type engine in the flight or maintenance manual will say before every flight, have a damn good look at the engine, propeller, and all the bits and pieces around it for cracks. Um, uh, and in the case of uh, DGs, we went through a spate of propellers falling off a couple of years ago. Um, no, actually about 10 years ago now, actually. Um, and uh, it took them many, many fixes. My understanding was nine of these fell off before they finally came up with a fix. And this one actually just embedded itself in the main spar of this um, British DG-1000. And it, ju well, it just missed the main spar, that one. Really serious damage. So on. But it's not just DGs that have this problem. This is the Champ Herf glider. This is the problem you're looking for. Now, the issue is, when you, it says inspect for cracks, it doesn't always show you exactly what cracks you're looking for, but this is the sort of thing you're looking for. Tiny little cracks like this on the propeller hubs. So, um, and blades. If you miss the damage, this can happen. The blade fell off, 
Uh, this is a Joe Discus from Holton, I think. Um, and the whole thing uh, broke. Uh, and uh, interesting enough, um, when they went to get a new propeller, it came out of a completely different hub. And it would be nice to know, wouldn't it, that the, that the um, original design of that has been super, superseded by um, that. But there's no paperwork anywhere. It tells you, actually, there's a better design out there. So, and in this case, the propeller blade went through the fuse large, dented the fuel tank, and restricted the controls. Really, really close to bailing out. Um, it could have been worse. It could have hit somebody else. So, yeah, have a damn good look at those. This is a kit into one gas strut that, because they're under permanent tension, um, you don't feel the play in them. So, what you have to do is open the canopies up, and when they're fully open, then push them a bit further. And if you feel play in it, it's because of this problem's happening. We've had quite a few of them. They've reached the end of the metal work, and then the canopy has collapsed. So, that in mind, but that's any glider front, rear canopies, and so on, gas struts, they hide the play. Um, ethanol we now have 10% ethanol in the UK, it kills most aircraft fuel lines, uh, unless they're made of Teflon. Um, so, you know, bear that in mind. It try to use Avgas or Unota 1, please don't use ethanol. Um, we're not going to major here much, but this is an SU 24, and we've got a great little video on it you can download after this. Um, this is a base rib here, and in this case, uh, the base rib was broken. And uh, the owner found the base rib was broken um, by walking down the grid and testing how stiff other SU 24s were compared to his. So on. Um, I won't go into detail now. We'll release the video and you can see that uh, later on. So on, I suggest. Um, and here's what a fixed SU 24 rib looks like. Okay, um, a central reading for being a BJ inspector. Um, there's an FAA book of AC43. Um, the link's here, go to it and so on. And it's about a thousand page long book, but it has lots of different chapters about propellers, hardware, how to make cables, um, how to do wire locking, nuts and bolts, rivets, um, how to do wood repairs, composite repairs. I, I, I would say the composite repair schemes aren't so great. But the wood ones are adequate. Uh, so on. um, but it's a book that's recommended by most of the aircraft manufacturers on, on being acceptable techniques for use on their aircraft. Um, and if you're ever going to fit equipment like radios and stuff, it also has some good generic principles in there um, as well. Uh, so it's a free download on the FA website, um, or you can just buy a copy. It's a really, really good book. And again, if you're serious about maintaining your glider, buy this book. It's not very expensive. Um, or, or download the sections you need to read and so on, but you know, give it a good read. Um, it really does tell you how to do just about everything there is to everything. So, and finally, um, in every single workshop I've ever worked at in my whole life, um, uh, a recurring problem, I'd say, has been trestles. Um, gliders have been repeatedly uh, broken by poor quality trestles. Um, working at the LS factory every single week, something will break due to falling off a trestle. And um, typically they'd be polishing something and they'd have a very low friction surface. And whatever they're polishing quite simply got flung off the trestle, be it a canopy, tailplane, elevator, entire wing, or fuse lighters in some cases. Um, so, on. Uh, so again, if you're gonna maintain your glider or you're serious about maintaining it, you know, get or make or buy decent trestles. They must have a soft, ideally high friction surface they mustn't be narrow. Um, you need to spread the load, especially on guys like K21s and stuff. It's so easy to crush um, their, the core, those few larges and so on, um, or the wings. Ideally, have it so you can turn the wing over on the trestle without the D-box hitting the stanchions and so on. But again, if you're gonna take your glider home and you need to turn the wings over lots and lots and lots, I highly recommend making or buying high quality trestles. Okay, and that's about it for me for the moment. So um, I was now going to go for any questions. Okay, can the placards uh, be on the glass of the ASI? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think the answer is generically no. A number of companies, um, LX Navigation and probably Navboys, I'm not sure, sell the placards. 
Um, taking the glass off is not normally a big job um, doing that. Um, so the issue of it being on the glass is you might get hysteresis. The glass will be out about probably five millimeters out from the needle. So depending on the angle, you might have like a three or four knot ever between it being on the glass and actually being on the ASI. So yeah, bit of a vague answer, but probably the best one I can give you. Hello down, by the way. All right, Kyle. All right, so so if we can do our own servicing, does that mean we can remove the control surfaces, clean and lubricate them? No, you can't. Um, it's black and white. If you do remove them, um, you have to have two inspectors um, sign them uh, the duplicates. One has to be legal there to fit them. Or you can fit it. He has to check you fitted it, and the other one has to check the work. Um, unlike the LA system and so on, uh, the pilot owner maintainers are not duplicate inspectors um, on that one. So, yes, if you take a control surface off, you can refit it, but you then need two inspectors to check your work. That's the law. So, on, and that's not going to change in a hurry. Um, so, yeah, it's unfortunate, but what you can do in terms of annual maintenance and pilot servicing is limited. And one of the limitations is you can't take your controls off, even though for most gliders, actually taking the rudder off and stuff like that would be common sense every annual. So, so yep. Yeah. Mike Forster, my arc is due on the 5th December. Should I wait? No, um, is the simple answer. Uh, we don't expect Brexit to have any difference to arcs and so on happening at all. Um, so on. We will be changing some of the ARC paperwork probably round about December, um, but it shouldn't cause you any delays and so on. Remember, the ARC and the annual are separate events and so on. So, no, there's, there's no reason it should make any difference at all um, on the 5th of December. The main difference, actually, think about it. If you are going to go abroad and so on, um, it might be easier with an ARC issue before Brexit, it may probably make no difference because the gliders are ICAO compliant anyway, so it makes no difference because they still have free use of uh, in Europe because they'd be an ICAO system. So no, carry on. Right, right. so Dave Sprague, are some strap colours more prone to fading discoloration than others? That's a very good question. Um, a lot of old old um, harnesses use the old Z harness system, and they're definitely prone to fading. Um, black, I think, is very clear because it goes grey in terms of you know colours. So that's a good question. I don't really know because most gliders straps are either blue or black, mostly black nowadays. But you can buy them any other colours. Um, I like bright green personally. So yes, good question. Um, I'm not sure is the answer. All right. Where do you get ADs for Pegasus? Oh, yes. Right. The BJ website has all the ADs for Pegasus um, on the BJ website. It goes to the BJ Compendium, um, so on, and they are in there. Now, what you will find from the Centro website, now, about four years ago, Centro were taken over by another company. Everyone, or they, they get bought out because they make little bits of um, for bombardier and missiles and military stuff and so on, because they have a um, approved manufacturing facility. That's why they're so valuable. And the company buying them out was initially going to dump the type, and the FFEV in France were going to take over it, which was going to be really good news because they were then going to publish all the this stuff on their website, and they were going to be um, able to repair um, Centraire ailerons because Centraire had a horrible habit when they made an SW20 or Pegasus, all their control surfaces are too heavy when they left the factory, and that's fine until you have to repair them. Because you then have to repair them to what the weights they what you know the weights the bank manual says they are, not the weights they were when they left the factory. And um, in some cases, you can't get the weights down, even with no paint on, they're still too heavy. And so, on. so yes, go to the BJ website in the BJ compendium. Um, there should be a link to the ADs there that are all on the BJ website. If you can't find it, contact the office and I'll send them to you. Do you do a of coin? Not necessarily. Um, Depends what you're tapping. Um, some people think a finger is a good um, tap test. Whatever you need a good percussion, basically. So no, I tend to use a coin, but not always. Um, yeah, you can do it with your fingers as well. Uh, it, the answer is anything that works for you. Um, it depends what you're tapping and density. Like if you're tapping carbon fiber, um, it's so stiff you probably need something uh, like a coin. Whether you're tapping something a bit softer like glass fiber, maybe not. So yes, fingers can work as well. 
just make logbook entry for any pilot owner maintenance is the worksheet is the worksheet sufficient no all pilot owner maintenance come park cow requires a logbook entry as well that's the law so yeah, i think it's back in my log sheet it's worksheet and that how do you know you're doing a 10 kilo force calibrate your arm um i don't know get a uh, um set of scales stick 10 kilos luggage on it and lift it um some people go have gone one stage further and they've used they've bought a spring balance and tried doing it that way um that can work 10 kilos is the best guess it's not exact it's an approximation so yeah next question is it possible to do x-rays through glass fiber yes i've done that a few times um in the olden days we used to have a company at lashing called dan air and um a couple of occasions we wanted to x-ray metalwork in a wing without cutting holes in it and then we'd usually sort of you know sell a tape a 20 pound note on it take it across down there and we then get x-ray pictures of showing us where the bell cracks we put in the right way around and stuff like that and so on so yes you can x-ray through glass fiber okay next question um oh don't forget the workshop practice book for wooden gliders i don't know about that one um kyle um please send me a link kyle tuncliffe that sounds like a really good book um i don't know about it so yes i don't know about it it might be a really good book and that's the workshop practice book for wooden gliders from the vintage sewing association i guess that is in america send me a link i do have the one if, you, if you're talking about the hans jacobs ones then yes i do have that one and it is the best book ever for wooden gliders don't forget yeah so thank you how often do the fungus tests have to be done on balsa sample up in a phoebus the answer is the airway directive only demanded it happen to the SW15 and 17, um, and 12, actually. I think all 12s were written off by then, um, after one broke up. The Phoebus, um, although the wings are made of bolster, the far bigger problem with the Phoebus is the fuselage is rot out. Um, we used to have them as club gliders at Lashman in the 1970s, and by the early 1980s, the whole lot had rotted out around the undercarriages and so on. And it's a massive job. It's probably 150 man hours to reinstate all the bolster correctly um, because they didn't have enough protection from all the mud and the water around the undercarriage. Um, I'm not aware of any ADs on the feeble checking the bolster other than actually check the bolster. Um, but if in doubt, um, if you go to Lintner, um, that, that's the same company that supports all the grobs. They, although Airbus technically are the support company for the Phoebus, they've delegated to Lindner, uh, who's also the GOB um, support. And if you talk to um, Lindner, they can give you any advice. Um, if you, they have a lot of good advice about the Phoebus on their website already, including how to make the wings bigger and fit it with wing bits. So, yeah. Okay. Is it safe to use methanol to remove glue residue on fiberglass after removing the wings? Right, um, I would have said on pure glass fiber, yes. It might well be a problem uh, on anything with a polyurethane type finish. So that might be a no. And the other issue is some types of glider, um, like Astir fins, Nimbus 2 fins, stuff like that. They actually use polystyrene packing foam as the main core in the sandwich there. And that collapses really easily. Anything built by Stingsby as well, the Vegas particularly, any um, solvent whatsoever on those and the cores collapse. And that then means big holes to repair all, all of it. So the answer is it's probably okay, so long as it doesn't leak into the core and don't put it anywhere near um, PU finishes. It, it might well damage that. Okay. Are you able to carry out daily inspections on club gliders when not having a bonds but being trained? The answer is you can do it under supervision. Um, you can't actually sign for it yourself, but you can do it under supervision, and it's a good thing to learn. When doing DIs, read the manual for the glider if you haven't done so already, because some gliders, especially anything with an engine like a geodiscus turbo, there's a whole lot of very specific things you have to look out that aren't generic. So, um, so yes, uh, but without a bonds, technically you can't sign for a DI. But you can still do it, but under supervision. My 1966 vintage has a simple drop-down DV panels. Can I change them for sliders? Ooh, um, I would have thought so. Um, is it an ARSA glider or not is the question. Um, if it's ARSA, it's a bit more complicated. If it's not ARSA, um, yes, I would have thought so. If it's a vintage top-down, I'm, I'm thinking maybe a dart or something like that. Um, the answer is I'd say yes, just get on with it. Um, so if it's an ARSA one, it's a bit more complicated. 
Uh, when standing wing, uh, when is it necessary to add on there of glass fiber um, or resin? Well, we showed you <coughs> um, an example earlier um, where we had a video of a LS4 wing that had gone too far. Now, usually when they build the wing, you have the layer of gel coat in the mold, and then you give it a layer of resin, and then you put the first layer of glass fiber in. And if the first layer of resin was particularly thick, you might just get away with the, the cracks being in the resin and not going through to the glass fiber. But the problem is the moment you hit the glass fiber, the outer layer of glass fiber is usually a very fine layer of what's called either called 92110 or 90070. And the moment you touch that, you've gone through it. Um, in which case, the only thing to do is actually replace that layer of glass fiber. Um, so, on. so peeling gel coat coming off on its own and fiber glass. Okay. Ah, now that's a different issue. What can happen is in when we built, used to build LS fours, they always insisted that you put the Vorglat gel coat into the mold, sprayed it in, and it goes off fully, and that always gave a very waxy finish. And you then brush a coat of resin on there. Um, and put the glass fiber in. But the reality was the bond between the first layer of resin and the gel coat was dreadful. Um, and after the job, if you just put a really strong tape on the gel coat, you could right literally rip the gel coat off from the glass fiber because it hadn't stuck and it was shiny underneath. Um, so yes, if you have a wing like that, you might well just be able to um, uh, remove the uh, gel coat, literally just with a chisel, just running along it, it'll just flake off possibly. So yeah, next question. Oh, yes, thank you, Chris. It's a dart, thought so, yeah. Yes, you can put um, rails on it if you want to, no problems. Okay, right, we have some problems with the bolts on this 24 gear, the, front, the ones in the front beside the winch hook. These are corroded and wouldn't come out. Do you have any tips for getting them out? Hmm, um, Many jobs in the glider require a hammer and a drift. The problem is you don't have enough space to get the hammer and drift in there. Um, this commonly happens on K21 front and the carriage mounts because there's a grease nipple in there, um, but nobody ever actually greases it. And then when you break the glider and take the undercarriage out, the only way you can get a, get space in there to get a drift on the bolt is to cut a hole inside the fuselage, which you then probably then got to fix. Um, Chris, I'm sorry, Max, whoever that is, send me a photograph and I'll give you an opinion. Um, I can't remember 24. I haven't worked on 24 for like 15 years. So, um, yeah, send me a photograph and I can give you an opinion. That's all I can do. Okay. All right. Is removing a toss took an air size, sending it to toss, winter, putting it back, a pilot owner maintenance? Right. Um, taking an air size and putting it back is not pilot, it is pilot owner maintenance as long as you just putting the, the pipes on the back and so on. Um, the tossed hook. That's a very good question. A hook. Um, is a what's called an air lie item. Um, it's subject to an air with directive with 10,000 actuations, and um, it's an air with directive that has to be changed at 10,000 actuations. Now, TOST have a formula on the website where typically it's between 1,200 and 2,000 launches, but ultimately it's up to the pilot or the owner how they calculate 10,000 actuations, um, and so on. Uh, but because it's an AD, I suggest changing a hook is not part of owner maintenance in terms of you can do the job, um, but an inspector actually has to sign the paperwork to say uh, that hook has been put back correctly. The reality is a hook is a very primary bit of equipment and it's quite easy to cock it up, putting it back. Um, it's quite, I've seen many people you know, make mistakes putting hooks back. So yes, you can, you can do the job yourself, but you can't sign for it yourself. So no, you have to have supervision of an inspector. Okay. Okay, you, you are we have to train propulsion technician for 35 years and gas turbines, current media inspector. Do I need to do any more to gain the jet power plant? Send me a personal experience um, uh, record of your experience with jet power plants and we'll have a look at it. Um, but the reality is you've got um, more experience than a lot of them have. So, yes, Mark Hanson, yes, the chances are if you do that, we will give it to you. But you need to apply on the BJ Inspector's application form and send us your actual experience, not just a qualification, the actual experience, what you've actually done to these engines. And if you look in the BGA Personal Experience Record Assessment on the website, um, you'll see the uh, types of work you need to prove to us you've done before. Um, so you're, you can tailor your personal experience record to actually fulfill what we actually need to see. When we finish the wing, how do you make sure the profile is uniform as per factory standard? Right. Um, this depends a bit on how old the glider is. 
because it wasn't until the 90s actually people started using sort of CAD and CNC machines to make molds accurate. Um, back in the 80s, I remember refinishing a mosquito. Um, actually, no, I've got another story, Janus wing. Um, back in the 90s, we had a Janus wing snapped in half. And uh, we had another Janus wing. And we thought, oh, brilliant. We'll just join the two together, make all the splices, join the spars, Bob's uncle, and it'd be a good, good glider. There was a problem, though. When we joined them together, um, the wings had a, about a one centimeter difference in height because the molds and the jigs were just totally dreadful. Um, you know, it varied how much they did the clamps up and all sorts of things. So um, if you actually got an old glider um, at a fixed station and, and saw a hole through the wing and checked whether it had the correct wing section, I am very certain you'll find it's nowhere near as the aircraft designer designed it. Um, if it is, it's more hit than miss. Because um, the, the moldings and the tooling in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s really wasn't very good. Um, and you know, you'd often find wings are literally half an inch thicker than they should be in some cases. Um, so, yes, whereas modern gliders like Ventus 2s, 27s, the tooling is probably CAD drawing, CNC tooling, way more accurate. On those gliders, they actually are far more likely to be where they should be. And that's one of the reasons why they're, they're obviously quite a lot better. Um, so, yes. Uh, that's the best I can answer that question. Old gliders, no. New gliders, yes. If you have doubts about the accuracy of an ASI, is there a method of check calibration uh, on the ground? Um, yes. Um, I don't know uh, where you are, um, Evelyn, but um, the easiest answer, if you haven't got any test equipment handy, is go to YouTube and look how to make a water manometer and so on. Um, the, apply, the rules of physics apply, and you have a water manometer, uh, you can check them to the nearest quarter or not quite happily. But you have to make your, if you haven't got the equipment, uh, you have to make your water manometer. And in the BJ, we allow a two knot error. Um, in a two seater, though, it's a slightly different set of rules because you don't want to um, glider say, well, for the front air side, under reading by two knots, the rear air side, over reading by two knots, because then the instructor will think you're flying two knots in error. So in two seaters, recommend the air size are fairly closely matched within a couple of knots. But the ASI must be within two knots of where a manometer says it should be. Okay. If you're a part statistics engineer, um, what are the routines to become a BJ inspector? Right. Um, the answer is you need some experience on gliders. Um, if you're B3, that helps. Um, the answer is send me a email with your experience, and I'll get back on to you on what you have to do. But nowadays, it's all about getting a Part 66 L license added to your Part 66 B1 license, um, for which you need to have some experience actually doing the job. So send me an email and I'll answer your question. Do you know if some glider manuals specify a minimum seat load? They do specify a minimum seat load. Um, typically, 70 kilos is the minimum. Um, it's a bit of a strange one, that, because quite often when you weigh the gliders, the by C of G, the minimum cockpit load is actually an awful lot less. Now, the BJ have a recommendation, I seem to recall, that the cockpit load for low experience pilots should be at least, I seem to recall, 15 or 20 kilos above the min cockpit load. So say, for instance, you might have a Caton to one with a min seat load of 55 kilos. Um, the placard from the uh, manual says 70 kilos. But in reality, you probably want 70 to 75 kilos anyway for an early solid pilot. But if the min cockpit load really is 70 kilos, you probably want 90 kilos in the cockpit. Um, so, yes, there is a min cockpit load of, say, 70 kilos for K21, but if by CFG the min cockpit load is actually 55 kilos, you need that information as well, so you can make sure that on early solo flights and stuff like that, you're not right on the RCFG limit, because that's bad news for um, early aerotos and stuff like that and so on. So, yes, they do have min cockpit loads placarded. Right, I think um, we have reached the end. Um, it's on now. Um, it's getting quite late. I've gone on way, way, way longer than I thought I should have done now, two and a half hours. If you have any questions, um, please email, email them to the BJ office and I'll do my best to um, get around to answering them. Um, this will be going, um, it's on YouTube, it will be going um, out there, uh, available for you to see outside of this. Um, and those of you who are in the BJ system, um, please. 
you know, become interested in doing your maintenance. Um, but always, if you're not sure, seek guidance. Don't just have a go. It's a very open culture, um, generally. And uh, if you can't get answers to your questions, um, if you ask me, I might not know the answer, but I probably know somebody who does. So, good. So, um, thank you very, very much for attending. And it's probably now to, time to bid you all good night. So, um, good night, and thanks for being here. Bye-bye.